The easiest thing I've done was to get out from under the labels and to live the life that I live. The most difficult thing I've ever done was to believe that I can do it. Uh, the difference is that when you don't know what's impacting you and it's, it's something that, that's holding you down and you're not aware of it, there are things that when you, in, in my situation, you live in a dominant culture that is designed to destroy your sense of self and your belief in yourself and, and you have to learn ways in which you can begin to connect with this power that you have within yourself to handle where you are. The key is to be constantly in a perpetual process of discovering the truth of who you are and fighting constantly to look for ways in which you can escape the inner conversation. Between ages zero and five, we determine what's available to us and what's not available to us. And so that was a defining moment. I knew there are certain things I could not do, certain places I could not go. They used to have signs on Miami Beach that said, Jews, dogs, and coloreds not allowed. And so now you have to operate within the constraints of, of the dominant society and the things that they have created for you. And it's a challenge to see yourself beyond that and to work to get outside of that even after those laws have changed because that has become so much a part of you, you unconsciously operate within the parameters of what has been put in place. Like you go, to, you're driving on the expressway, the four or five, and, and, and you'll get off on an exit that you weren't going in that direction, but you unconsciously did it because you've done it so many times that many people, because they're not making a conscious, deliberate, determined effort to think outside of what life has thrown at them, they end up doing the same thing over and over and over again. Einstein said that thinking that has brought me this far has created some problems that this thinking can't solve. And so through relationships, through reading, through studies, through goals and dreams beyond your comfort zone, it, it allows you to begin to live out of your imagination as opposed to out of your history. D Disney said, the imagination is a preview of what's to come. They have to expose themselves to something that will give them a different vision of themselves. And in addition to that, they have to put themselves in a community of what I call OQP, only quality people. A gentleman who dramatically transformed my life, I was a junior at Booker T. Washington High School in Miami, Florida, and I went in his class looking for another friend. and. And he said, go to a board and work this problem out for me. I said, sir, I can't do that. He said, why not? I said, uh, I'm not one of your students. He said, do it anyhow. And, and the other kids started laughing, saying, he's Leslie. He's DT. And he said, what's DT? He's, his brother is smart, but he's the dumb twin. And, and I said, I am, sir. And he came from behind his desk and he pointed at me. He said, don't you ever say that again someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And he taught me three things. He said, if you want to become successful in life, young man, he said, number one, you got to change your mindset. He said, you don't get in life what you want, you get in life what you are. Number two, practice OQP, only quality people. You earn within two to three thousand dollars of your closest friends. I found that out. I left all my bro broke friends. I said, "Y'all gotta go," because <laughs> I used to be so broke I'd pass the bank and trip the alarm. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and the third thing he said: develop your communication skills because once you open your mouth, you tell the world who you are. He said those are three major things that you want to work on that will liberate you from living in Liberty City, living in poverty and over town. It will help to escape out of where you are right now because I see you watching me and I know you want more. I can see the hunger in your eyes.
You get hungry by finding something that's you. I believe that all of us are born unique, but most of us die copies. You gotta find out what is it that turns you on, what resonates with you. Uh, one of the things that I realized and what allowed me to become successful as a speaker, the speaking industry has been hijacked by people who speak to sell, and it's, it's okay to do that and make money. I speak to change lives because somebody spoke and change my life. So this is my passion. This is my drive. This is something that I feel in my heart. And, and so the key to that hunger-driven life is a heart-centered life. I didn't do what I'm doing for years because of my programming, because of the culture in which I was raised in. I would see other people with, with degrees and PhDs and and MBAs and credentials I don't have, and I convinced myself I couldn't do it. But Mr. Washington, on that day, we became friends, and, and he taught me not only someone's opinion of you does, does not have to determine your reality, he said that you have to work on yourself and you have to have an unstoppable attitude and no excuse is acceptable and you've got to, to make it a, a, a priority, a non-negotiable in your life and hold a, a constant vision of what it is you want to achieve. See it accomplished and go all out. Find a way to win in spite of the setbacks, in spite of the disappointments, in spite of your failures. I, I tell people when I'm giving presentations, you will fail your way to success. I have a saying is life knocks you down, try and land on your back because if you can look up, you can get up. <laughs> and so those experiences of, of going after goals that's beyond your comfort zone and having relationships that will challenge you and surrounding yourself with coaches and mentors who can take you to a place within yourself that you can't go by yourself because you can't read the label when you're locked in the box. And so those experiences, they challenge you to go to that next level and continue to move forward in your life doing new and exciting things that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered the heart of mankind what God has in store for you when you live a hard-centered life, deciding that you're gonna live a life that will outlive you. You're gonna live a life that counts, a life that will build a legacy and change the planet. You know, Horace Mann said, we should be ashamed to die until we've made some major contribution to humankind. And so my goal, is to make a, a major contribution to humankind. Every day when I get up, my mindset is, what is it that I can do to touch and impact somebody's life today? What is it, what does that look like? Don't live the life that has been given you. By the circumstances, by the people that's around you, that Sidney Poitier wrote a book called The Measure of a Man. And he said, when you go for a walk with someone, something happens without being spoken. He said, either you adjust to their pace or they adjust to your pace. Whose pace have you adjusted to? And so there are things that we pick up and we think that they're our choices, but they're the choices that we've been programmed by life to, to do, um, we, when we leave our homes in the morning, we are bombarded with over 6,000 advertising hits through Facebook, through Twitter, through Instagram, through television, through our phones and through our communities uh, and through the computers. And so all of these things are impacting us every day. So if you don't have a program for your mind, then your mind is going to be programmed and you'll find yourself doing things that you did not know and, and that they affected you, that they, through marketing techniques and strategies, that they will create a thirst within you. I came up in an era that said, if you built the best mousetrap, the world would be the path to your door. But if you know marketing, people will sleep outside your store 
to buy a telephone they've never touched or seen. I was trying to think, what could I say that, that could actually be helpful or useful to you in the future? And uh, I thought I'd perhaps uh, tell the story of how I sort of came to be here. How did some of these things happen? And, and maybe there's some lessons there, because I, I often find myself wondering how did this happen. So when I was young, I, I, uh, I didn't really know what I was going to do when I got older. People kept asking me, and eventually I thought that the idea of inventing things would be, would be really cool. And the reason I thought that was because I, I read a quote from Arthur C. Clarke, which said that a sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And that's really true. If you go back, say, 300 years, the things that we take for granted today, you'd, you'd be burned at the stake for. You know, being able to fly, that's crazy. Being able to see over long distances, being able to communicate, having um, effectively with the internet a group mind of sorts, and having access to all the world's information instantly from almost anywhere on the earth. This is stuff that, that really would be magic, or would be considered magic in times past. In fact, I think it actually goes beyond that because there are many things that we take for granted today that weren't even imagined in, in times past. They weren't even in the realm of magic. So it actually goes, goes beyond that. So I thought, well, you know, if, if, if I can do some of those things, basically if I can advance technology, then that, that's like magic and that would be really cool. And I always had sort of a slight existential crisis because I was trying to figure out what, what does it all mean? Like what's the purpose of things? And I came to the conclusion that if, if we can advance the knowledge of the world, if we can do things that expand the scope and scale of consciousness, then we're better able to ask the right questions and become more enlightened. And that's really the only way forward. So I studied uh, physics and business because I figured in order to do a lot of these things, you, you need to know how the universe works and you need to know how, how the economy works. And you also need to be able to bring a lot of people together to work with you to create something, because it's very difficult to do something as, as an individual if it's, if it's a significant technology. So I originally came out to, to California to try to figure out how to improve the energy density of, of electric vehicles, basically to, to try to figure out if there was an advanced capacitor that, that, that could serve as an alternative to batteries. That was in 95. And that's also when the internet uh, started to happen and I thought well I can either pursue this this technology where success maybe may not be one of the possible outcomes which is always tricky or participate in the internet and and be, be part of it so I decided to, to drop out did some internet stuff did, did a few things here and there one of which is PayPal. And, and I think maybe it's helpful to say one of the things that was important then in the creation of PayPal was kind of how it started because the initial thought was with PayPal was to create an agglomeration of financial services so if you have one place where all your financial services needs would be seamlessly integrated and work smoothly. And then we had like a little feature which was to do email payments. And whenever we'd show the system off to someone, we'd show the hard part, which was the agglomeration of financial services, which was quite difficult to put together. Nobody was interested. Then we'd show people email payments, which was actually quite easy, and everybody was interested. So uh, this is, uh, I think it's important to, to, to take feedback from your environment. You know, you want to be as closed loop as possible. So we focused on email payments and really try to make that work. And, and that's what really got things to take off. But if we hadn't responded to what people said, then we we'd probably would not have been successful. So it, it's important to look for things like that and focus on them when you see them and you correct uh, your, your prior assumptions. And then go, going from PayPal, I thought, well, what are some of the, the other problems that uh, are likely to most affect the, the future of humanity? It really wasn't from the perspective of what's the rank ordered best way to, to make money which is okay, but it was really what I think is going to most affect the future of humanity. So I think the, the, the biggest terrestrial problem we've got is sustainable energy, but the production and consumption of energy in a sustainable manner. If we don't solve that this century, we're, we're in deep trouble. And then the, the other one being the extension of life beyond Earth to make life multiplanetary. So 
the latter is the basis for SpaceX and the former is the basis for Tesla and, and SolarCity. And when I started SpaceX, it actually, initially, I thought that, well, there's, there's no way one could possibly start a rocket company. I, I wasn't that crazy. I thought, well, what is a way to increase NASA's budget? That was actually my initial goal. So I thought, well, if we can do a low-cost mission to Mars, something called Mars Oasis, which would land seeds and dehydrated nutrient gel, and you hydrate them upon landing, and then you'd have this great sort of money shot of green plants on a red background. The public tends to respond to um, precedents and superlatives, and this would be the first life on Mars, the furthest that life's ever traveled, as far as we know. And I thought, well, that, that would get people really excited and therefore increase the NASA's budget. So obviously, the, the financial outcome from such a mission would probably be zero. So anything better than that was on the upside. So I actually went to Russia three times to look at buying a refurbished ICBM because that was the best deal. And uh, I can tell you it was very weird going there in, in 2000, late 2001, 2002, going to the Russian rocket forces and saying, I'd like to buy two of your biggest rockets, but you can keep the nuke. <laughs> that, that's a lot more. They thought I was crazy, but I did have money, so that was, that was okay. After making several trips to, to Russia, I, I came to the conclusion that actually my initial impression was, was wrong because my initial thought was, well, that there's not enough will to explore and expand beyond Earth and have a Mars base and that kind of thing. But I came to the conclusion that that was wrong. In fact, there's plenty of will, particularly in the United States, uh, because the United States is a nation of explorers, of people who came here from, from other parts of the world. And I think the United States is really a distillation of the spirit of human exploration. But if people think it's impossible or it's going to completely break the federal budget, then they're not going to do it. So after my third trip, I said, okay, well, what we really need to do here is try to solve the space transport problem and, uh, and started SpaceX. And uh, this, this was against the advice of pretty much everyone I talked to. My one friend made me sit down and watch a bunch of videos of rockets blowing up. Let me tell you, he wasn't far wrong. It was tough going there in the beginning because I'd never built anything physical. I mean, I'd built like little model rockets as a kid and that kind of thing, but I'd never had a company that built anything physical. So I had to kind of figure out how to do all these things and bring together the right team of people. And so we did all that and then failed three times. It was tough, tough going. Because the thing about a rocket is the passing grade is 100%. And... Uh, you, you don't get to actually test the rocket in the real environment that it's going to be in. So I think so the best analogy for rocket engineering is, is like if you want to create a really com complicated bit of software, you can't run the software as an integrated whole, and you can't run it on the computer it's intended to run on. But the first time you put it all together and run it on that computer, it must run with no bugs. That's basically the essence of it. So we, we missed the mark there. The first launch, I was picking up bits of rocket near the the launch site was a bit sad. But we, we learned with each successive flight and were able to eventually with the fourth flight in 2008 uh, reach orbit. And that was also with the last bit of money that we had. So um, thank goodness that happened. I think the saying is fourth time's the charm. So we, we got the Falcon 1 to orbit and then uh, began to scale that up to the Falcon 9, which is um, about an order of magnitude more uh, thrust. It's uh, around a million pounds of thrust. And we managed to get that to orbit and then uh, developed a Dragon spacecraft, uh, which um, recently was able to dock and return to Earth from the space station. That was a white knuckled event. It's a, it's a huge relief. Still can't quite believe it actually happened. But there's a lot more that must happen beyond this in order for humanity to become a spacefaring civilization, and ultimately a multi-planet species. And that's something I think is it's vitally important, and I hope that some of you will participate in that, either at SpaceX or, or at other companies, because it's just really one of the most important things for the preservation and extension of consciousness.
I mean, it's worth noting, as I'm sure people are aware, that the Earth has been around for four billion years, and civilization, at least in terms of having writing, has been around for 10,000 years, and that's being generous. So it's really uh, it's somewhat of a tenuous existence that uh, civilization and, and consciousness, as, as we know it, has, has been on Earth. And I think um, I'm actually fairly optimistic about the future of Earth. I don't want to sort of people to have the wrong impression that I think we're all about to die. I think things will most likely be okay for a long time on Earth. But not for sure, but most likely. But, but even if it's sort of 99% likely, a 1% chance, it's still worth spending a fair bit of effort to ensure that we have backed up the biosphere, you know, planetary redundancy, if you will. So I think, I think it's really, really quite important. And in order to do that, there's a breakthrough that needs to occur, which is to create a, a rapidly and completely reusable transport system to Mars. Which is one of those things that's right on the borderline of impossible. That's sort of the thing that we're going to try to achieve there with SpaceX. And then on the Tesla front, the goal with Tesla was really to try to show what electric cars can do, because people had the wrong impression. We had to change people's perception of an electric vehicle, because they used to think of it as something that was slow and ugly and had low range, kind of like a golf cart. So that's why we created the Tesla Roadster, to show that you can be fast, attractive, and, and long range. And it's amazing how, um, even though you can show that something works on paper, and the calculations are very clear, until you actually have the physical object and they can drive it, it doesn't really sink in for people. So that, I think, is something worth noting. If, if you're going to create a company, the first thing you should try to do is create a working prototype. You know, everything, everything looks great on PowerPoint. You can make anything work on PowerPoint, but if you have an actual demonstration article, even if it's in primitive form, that's much, much more effective for convincing people. After we made the Tesla Roadster, people said, oh, sure, sure, we, we always knew you could make a car like that. It's an expensive car, uh, and it's low volume, and it's small, and all that, but you couldn't make a real car. Uh, like, okay, fine, we've got to make that too. But um, I, I think the overarching point I want to make is that you guys are the magicians of the 21st century. Don't let anything hold you back. Imagination is the limit, and go out there and create some magic. Thank you. Sit on your bed one day and ask yourself, uh, What's, what remarkably stupid things am I doing on a regular basis to absolutely screw up my life? And if you actually ask that question, but you have to want to know the answer, right? Because that's actually what asking the question means. It doesn't mean just mouthing the words. It means you have to decide that you want to know. You'll figure that's out so fast it'll make your hair curl. There's no better pathway to self-realization and the ennoblement of being than to posit the highest good that you can conceive of and commit yourself to it. And then you might also ask yourself, and this is definitely worth asking, is do you really have anything better to do? And if you don't, well, why would you do anything else? If you orient yourself properly and then pay attention to what you do every day, that works. And it, I actually think that that's in accordance with, with what we have come to understand about human perception because what happens is that the world shifts itself around your aim. Because you're a, you're a creature that has an aim. You have to have an aim in order to do something. You're an aiming creature. You look at a point and you move towards it. It's built right into you. And so you have an aim. Well, let's say your aim is the highest possible aim. Well, then, so that sets up the world around you. It, it organizes all of your perceptions. It organizes what you see and you don't see. It organizes your emotions and your motivations. So you organize yourself around that aim. And then what happens is the day manifests itself as a set of challenges and problems. And if you solve them properly, then you stay on the pathway towards that aim. And you can concentrate on the, on the, on the day. And so that way you get to have your cake and eat it too. Because you can, you can point into the distance, the far distance, and you can live in the day. And it seems to me that that's, that makes every moment of the day supercharged with meaning. That, that's how, because if everything that you're doing every day is related to the highest possible aim that you can conceptualize, well, that's the very definition of the meaning that would sustain you in your life. Well, and then the issue is, well, back to Noah. Well, all hell's about to break loose and chaos is coming. It's like when that's happening in your life, you might want to be doing something that you regard as truly worthwhile. Because that's what will keep you afloat 
when, when everything is flooded. And you don't want to wait until the flood comes to start doing that because if your ark's half built and you don't know how to captain it, the probability is very high that, that you'll drown. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. That sounded pretty optimistic again. But, but again, I think it's a description of the structure of existential reality. And, and by, by which I mean... When I'm in my clinical practice and I observe, and this is also the case with my students, is let's say... People's lives aren't what they would like them to be. And so then you ask, why? Well, forget about tragedy and catastrophe, because that's self-evident, and we're not going to discuss that. Although the degree to which you bring about your own tragedy is always indeterminate. But I would never say that every terrible thing that is visited on a person is something they deserved. I think that that's a very dangerous presupposition especially because everyone gets sick and everyone dies. But one of the main reasons that people don't get what they want is because they don't actually figure out what it is. And the probability that you're going to get what would be good for you, let's say, which would even be better than what you want, right? Because, you know, you might be wrong about what you want easily. But maybe you could get what would really be good for you. Well, why don't you? Well, because you don't try. You don't think, okay, here's what I would like if I could have it. And, and I, don't mean, I don't mean in a way that you manipulate the world to force it to deliver you goods for status or something like that. That isn't what I mean. I mean something like, imagine that you were taking care of yourself like you were someone you actually cared for. And then you thought, okay, I, I'm caring for this person. I would like things to go as well for them as possible. What would their life have to be like in order for that to be the case? Well, people don't do that. They don't sit down and think, all right, you know, let's, let's figure it out. You're, you've got a life. It's hard, obviously. It's like three years from now, you can have what you need. You've got to be careful about it. You can't have everything. You can have what would be good for you. But you have to figure out what it is. And then you have to aim at it. Well, my experience with people has been is if they figure out what it is that would be good for them and then they aim at it, then they get it. And it's strange because they don't necessarily, it's a strange thing. It's not quite that simple because, you know, you may formulate an idea about what would be good for you and then you take 10 steps towards that and you find out that your formulation was a bit off and so you have to reformulate your goal. You know, you're, so you're kind of going like this as you move towards the goal. But a huge part of the reason that people fail is because they don't ever set up the criteria for success. And so, since success is a very narrow line and very unlikely, the probability that you're going to stumble on it randomly is zero. And so, there's a proposition here, and the proposition is, if you actually want something, you can have it. Now, the question then would be, well, what do you mean by actually want? And the answer is that you reorient your life in every possible way to make the probability that that will occur as certain as possible. And that's a sacrificial idea, right? It's like, you don't get everything. Obviously, you, obviously. But maybe you can have what you need. And maybe all you have to do to get it is ask. But the asking isn't a whim or, or today's wish. It's like, you have to be deadly serious about it. You have to think, okay, like I'm taking stock of myself. And if I was going to live properly in the world and I was going to set myself up such that being would justify itself in my estimation, and, and I don't mean as a harsh judge, exactly what is it that I would aim at? And so the issue is not so much the blindness of others, even though there's as much blindness among others as there is, in, as there is for you. But the issue here, the advice here, the description here is you should be concerned about what's interfering with your own vision first. And you should leave other people the hell alone in relationship to that. And so if your mode of being in the world is, if you would just act better, things would improve for me. Or if 
you identify the evil and the catastrophe as something that's outside that someone else needs to fix or that someone's response someone else is responsible for then you're not going to fix that and you're going to remain blind to the things that you're doing and not doing that make things not go well and so it's just better to think all right i'm probably blind in many many ways and maybe there are some ways that i could rectify that because it's highly probable that you're blind in all sorts of ways i mean it's it's in fact it's virtually certain and so it's just more useful to think how is it that i'm wrong in this situation i'll tell you something that i learned to do when i was arguing with my wife which happened quite frequently because when you actually communicate with people you find out that there's many things that you don't agree on and that's because you're actually different creatures and so if you're actually going to have a truthful conversation then you're going to find out that you don't see things the same way and then you can either pretend that that's not the case and gloss over it and then end up in a 30 year silent war or you can or you can have the damn fight when you need to have it and see if you can straighten it out so now and then we'd get in a situation where we were at loggerheads we couldn't move and you know it would spiral up into hate speech let's say cuz yeah everyone laughs because they know they manifest plenty of hate speech towards those they love so one of the things we learned to do was when we hit hit an impasse was to separate and to go our own ways and to go sit and think okay look we're at this unpleasant situation we can't figure out how to move forward i'd always think of course it's her fault obviously it's her fault at least 95% but maybe there was something i did that contributed like 5% to it the amount of information that's been created from the dawn of humanity since human beings walked this planet to the year 2003 which is only what a decade and a half ago that amount of information how long does it take to create that nowadays two days the amount of information is doubling at dizzying speeds but how we learn it how we absorb it focus retain it apply it is pretty much flatline and that growing gap creates something called anxiety mm. they call it information fatigue syndrome because everything's a syndrome right yeah. higher blood pressure compression of leisure time more sleeplessness cuz we live in an age where you know electric cars and spaceships that are going to mars but our vehicle of choice when it comes to learning and education is like a horse and buggy mm-hmm. you know like the education system has not we all grew up with the 20th century education that prepared us for a 20th century world which at the turn of the 20th century was working in farms and factories and uh and that's what the education was it was assembly line cookie cutter one size fits all but now we live in a world where the world's changing so much someone graduating school today is going to have 8 to 14 different careers. Can you imagine that? Not jobs, but different careers because we don't know where the world's going to be. So your ability to outlearn, outthink, outperform, I mean that's your greatest advantage. If there's one skill to master in the 21st century, it's your ability to learn rapidly, mm. to be able to keep up. So digital overload. digital this second digital super villain today that i think is a health threat to all everyone listening whether you're an entrepreneur you're a parent you're a high achiever is this thing called digital distraction think about all the social media alerts the app updates i mean our minds are being fried because we're getting these dopamine fixes all the time do you know how often the average person opens up instagram it's now 150 times And then if you guys are opening up a less, that means somebody's opening up a whole lot more. But that's by design, mm. right? Because every like, share, comment, you get this dopamine flood and it it drives our, you know, our 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 habits and our addiction if you will. And we talk a lot about routines and now we're going to talk about how to jump start your brain, morning routine, evening routines because I mean, really the success that everyone is desiring, it's hidden in our daily habits. right first you create your habits and then your habits create you but one of the things that a bad habit the most successful people they have their to-do list and we all have our to-do list but i've also noticed that some of the highest achievers they have a not to-do list you know what i mean they have a list of non-negotiable things they will not indulge in because you know we've all read the book good to great you say no to good so you can say yes to great right and a lot of times when you get more and more successful you suffer from this opportunity stress Right? you get more and more offers more and more opportunity and you can't say yes to everything and that's a big challenge because then you have so many windows open on your computer 
And even if they're minimized, they still take up energy and they take, still take up space and memory. And you wonder why you're fatigued all the time. You wonder why you don't have the mental energy to do the things that you need to be able to do. So digital distraction and on the top of your not to do list should be not checking your phone in the first thing in the morning. And I know everyone's listening to me and, and automatically so many people are just like, oh my God, you know, like I hate, you know, I hate this guy. But the first hour of the day, the reason why you don't want to pick up your phone is because, and we're all guilty of this, is because it rewires your brain for two things. Number one, it rewires your brain for distraction. When you wake up first thing in the morning, you're in this relaxed, alpha, creative, very suggestible state, right? You just woke up. And so you have to be very careful and protect and stand guard to your mind from outside influences because number one if the first thing you see on your phone you're watching these cat videos and you know everything that's going on, on social media you're getting these dopamine flood which is building your distraction muscles because when it comes to focus focus is is like there's a focus fitness if you will and you have focus muscles but you also have distraction muscles and a lot of people their distraction muscles are way overdeveloped because of picking the phone up first thing in the morning but the second reason for a neurological re reason why you don't want to pick up your phone the first hour of the day is because it also rewires your brain for reaction. It's training your brain to be reactive. And so, you know, as you know, you, get, you go through your phone, you wake up in the morning, you pick up your phone, you get one text, one voicemail message, one, you know, email, and all of a sudden your day is shot. Mm -hmm. Like it puts you in a bad mood and you carry that mood throughout your entire day. And that's a big challenge because... You know, if you're just fighting fires, then you're just on the defense. If you're just trying to fulfill everyone else's needs without going through like what's going to help me to win this day, to own this, you know, this day, to be able to make it the best, then um, then you're you're reacting. And I have a, I have a friend Brendan Burchard. He says your inbox is nothing but a convenient organizational system for other people's agenda for your life. Mm -hmm. So you're training your brain to react, and you can never have an incredible day if you're just reacting to things, right? So for me, I wake up in the morning and what I just start journaling and I write down three things I want to accomplish personally that day and three things I want to accomplish professionally. And it's different every single day, but I always begin with the end in mind. One of my favorite books of all time is this book called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Mm -hmm. And we've read this book. Some people are like, I have that book and it's sitting on my shelf. And it becomes shelf help, not self-help, right? Because nobody's actually <laughs> like reading that book. Because so many people buy books. And I have the, I like to encourage people to read at least one book a week because the average person reads about two, maybe three books a year. But what I love about reading, number one, is the best exercise, you know, for your mind. And, you know, it's it's like reading is to your mind what exercise is to your body. It's an incredible workout. And uh, but most people, they don't take the time to read. But the other reason I like to read um, is if somebody has decades of experience in leadership, negotiation, entrepreneurship, fitness, and they put it into a book, and you can sit down in a couple of days and read that book, you could download decades of experience into days. And that's a huge advantage, right? Because leaders, leaders are readers. When I'm writing what I need to accomplish, I'm writing put first things first. Put first things first. Meaning I believe that the most important thing is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. The most important thing is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. Because a lot of people have a fear of a failure or fear of success. You know, my 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 fear has always been I don't want to succeed at things that don't matter. It wasn't so much about failing, it's about getting really good at something that didn't make a difference. And Stephen Covey talks about it, like you're really good at climbing the ladder of success only to get to the top and realize that it's leaning on the wrong wall. Mm. And so if you begin with the end in mind, so I'm thinking about my friend uh, Clay Bear has this phrase about uh, champagne moments. You know, in sports, it's very clear when you're popping that champagne, what has to happen, your criteria. And for me, I think about if I'm coming back, you know, at night and somebody ha asked me how my day was and I was like, I crushed it today. You know, what had to happen working backwards in order for that to happen? And I think about three things professionally, three things personally. And so I write that down first thing in the morning and then I don't check my phone until I get one of those checks done. Just at least one thing, you know, and then I get some positive momentum, for example. But that's the reason you don't want to check your phone. It's training you to be distracted and it's rewiring your brain to be reactive. And you can't be successful and fulfilled if you're just giving up the sovereignty, your power to some, some something outside of yourself. The third digital, like, 
super villain, if you will, when we're talking about you know digital uh, challenges, is um, so you have digital overload, digital distraction, is digital dementia. Have you heard this term yet? No. You're going to hear this a lot in healthcare. It's basically where we're outsourcing our our brains our minds to our smart devices. Oh, this is why I can't remember anybody's phone number. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, how many phone numbers did you know growing up? As a, as all a of them. All yeah. of them. Literally all of them because yeah. we had to, right? Yeah. And how many phone numbers do you know right now? Two. Yeah. But the, the old <laughs> ones that don't that the I ones knew that when don't I was a kid. Anymore. Mine and my wife's, yeah. Exactly. So you know like one or two. There could be somebody you're texting or calling every single day and if your phone was dead or if you didn't have it with you, you wouldn't honestly know what that number is. No. And here's the thing, I don't want to memorize 500 phone numbers. Nobody wants to do that, but we've lost the ability to remember one phone number. We've lost the ability to remember a conversation, somebody's birthday. I mean, I feel like absent-mindedness. I mean, how many people feel like senior moments are coming too early? Like you walk <laughs> into a room and you just forget why you're there. Mm -hmm. Or you open up the refrigerator. You go to the store to buy one thing and you come back with like two bags full of things, except for that one thing you went to, you know, get there. Get there. Or you can't remember if you, you're in the shower, you can't remember if you shampooed your hair, your hair. And I believe two of the most costly words in life and in business are I forgot. You know, I forgot to do it. I forgot to bring it. I forgot that conversation. I forgot that meeting. I forgot what I needed to say. I forgot that name. Mm. I mean, I think number one business etiquette, networking mm. skill there is, is remembering people's names. We don't realize how much time we're spending on these devices, right. right? When you go and you actually look at the numbers, when you look at your phone and you look at like you're somebody spending like 24 hours a week, you know, on, on social media or whatever it is. I mean, that's people always say, oh, I have no time to read or I have no time to work out. <laughs> it has nothing to do with with time management. It's all priority management. I think the definition of greatness is to inspire the people next to you. Yeah, I, I think that's what greatness is or should be. It's, it's not something that's, that, that lives and dies with one person. Mm. It's how can you inspire a person to then in turn inspire another person that yeah. then inspires another person. And that's how you create something that I think lasts forever. Yeah. And uh, I think that's our challenge as people is to, um, is to figure out how our story can impact others and mm. motivate them in a way to create their own greatness. There's a quote from uh, one of my English teachers at Lower Marion named uh, uh, Mr. Fisk. He had a great quote that said, rest at the end, not in the middle. And that's something I always live by. You know, I'm not gonna rest, I'm gonna keep on pushing now. There are a lot of answers that I don't have, even questions that I don't have, but I'm just gonna keep going. I'm just gonna keep going and I'll figure these things out as we go, right? And you just continue to build that way. So that, I try to live by that all the time. And what brings you the most joy right now? Being with my family. Really? That is, man, that is the most fun. It's just, um, you know, it's uh, hanging out with them all summer, uh, being able to, to like do things that I ordinarily couldn't do. Yeah. Because uh, of training, because of sure. season and stuff like that. So being around them and watching Bianca grow up, because there are a lot of things that I miss with Natalia and Gianna mm. because I was playing. So being there every day with them is so much fun, man. So uh, it brings me the most joy. What does love feel like? Hmm. Happiness is such a, I mean, I think I would describe love as happiness. I think I'd describe it as a beautiful journey. Mm. Um, you know, it has its ups and downs, right? Whether it's in marriage, or whether it's in the career, you know, things are never perfect. But through love, you continue to persevere and you mm. move through them. You move through them. And then through that storm, beautiful sun emerges. Yeah. Right? And inevitably another storm comes. And guess what? You ride that one out too. Yeah. So I think love is a certain determination and persistence to go through the good times and the bad times with the someone or something uh, that you truly love. My parents were, were great. You know, growing up, you know, they instilled in me the importance of imagination, of curiosity, and understanding that, okay, if you want to accomplish something, I'm not just going to sit here and say, yes, you can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can, but you have to also put in the work to get there, right? So they taught me that at a really early age, man. And uh, when you grow up as a kid thinking that the world is your oyster, all things are possible if you put in the work to do it, you, know, you grow up having that fundamental belief. My mom was there on a daily basis. Uh, my father, 
uh, was really influential at a really critical time where I, you know, I had a summer where I played basketball when I was like 10 or 11 years old in a very prominent summer league in Philadelphia called the Sunny Hill League. Where my father played, my uncle played, and they were like all time greats yeah. and such stuff. And Will Chamberlain played in the league, you know, uh, Earl of Pro Monroe played in the league. And here I come playing, and I don't score one point the entire summer. Really? Not one. How old were you? 11, 10, 11. And you're playing against other 10, 11 year olds? Uh -huh. or and you didn't score once. Not one. Were you in the game? I was in the game. How did you not score? Because I was terrible. Really? <laughs> yeah. That At happened. 10, 11 years old, you were that terrible. Awful. I mean, I, you know, and I had these big knee pads on because I was no. growing really <laughs> fast. I had socks all the way up here and I had like the high top skinny, fades, yeah. like skinny as hell. And I scored not a free throw, not a nothing, not a lucky shot, not a breakaway layup, zero points. And I remember crying about it and being upset about it. And my father just gave me a hug and said, listen, whether you score zero or score 60, I'm gonna love you no matter what. Wow. Now that is the most important thing that you can say to a child. Because from wow. there, I was like, okay, that gives me all the confidence in the world to fail. I have the security there. But to hell with that, I'm scoring 60. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> right, right. Right, and from there, I just went to work. And I just wow. I stayed with it and I kept practicing, kept practicing, kept practicing. You know, when you're in, a, in this culture, in our society, you, you can do some phenomenal things individually, um, but they'll never reach their full potential unless you do them collectively. And you have to figure out how to do that. The challenge for me was always um, compassion and empathy. I think about 09, things started changing for okay. me. I started really uh, making a conscious effort to better understand. And that doesn't mean I mean, you have compassion and empathy so you go soft on them. It's more like you, you, put, you put yourself to the side and you put yourself in their shoes and understand what they're feeling. And then you have to make certain decisions of, okay, what buttons do I need to push for this yeah. player to get them to the mm -hmm. next level? So it's never, it's not sit around and all, it's all happy-go-lucky right. type of thing. Your leader, your job is to get the best out of them, um, even if you know, they may not like it at that time. One of the things that I had to learn is how to get the best out of my teammates. Yeah. And most people think it's a simple thing, you know, pass them the ball. You know, but that's not how you make guys better. You have to really affect their behavior. How do you do that? So, you know, like, you know, I would tell guys, you got to back to backs. You know, I don't care if we're in Miami. I don't care if we're in a great city of Chicago. You can't go out. We got to get rest. Right? Back to back games. Back to back games, yeah. right? Monday, Tuesday. You play Monday and play again Tuesday. The guys aren't going to listen, right? You don't, you know, right. So, you know, a few times say, all right, we'll all go out. <laughs> go out together. Really? I'm, I'll drink with you, right? But the next morning, I'm banging on your door at five in the morning. Let's go. They're not getting Where are we going? <laughs> I hung out with you. Now you come hang out with me. Wow. This is what we do, all right? Let's go. And we're at the gym. We're working out, right? We hit the bus. We go to practice. We play that night. And they're dead. And they're dead. And they're like, oh, lesson learned. <laughs> really? <laughs> lesson learned. So take them out once. Listen, if you're going to do that, do that. But don't let that compromise what we're here to do. Right. This is why we're here. This is why you're here in the first place. What does losing feel like to you? Uh, it's exciting. Why is it exciting? Um, because it means you have different um, ways to get better. There are certain things that you can figure out that you can take advantage of, right? Certain weaknesses that were exposed mm. um, that you need to shore up. Right, so it was exciting. I mean, it, I mean, it sucks to lose. Right. But at the same time, there are answers there if you just look at them. I'll give you an example. So uh, Katie Lou Samuelson is one of the best college basketball players in the country. She plays at UConn, she's gonna be a senior. And uh, they just had a really tough season last year where they lost to Notre Dame in the final. And so I asked her, I said, have you watched the Notre Dame game? She was like, no. I said, well, why not? I said, I don't wanna watch that. I said, I know you don't, but you're gonna play Notre Dame this year, yeah? Yeah. What's the chances you see him again in the final? Goes, well, you probably see him again. I said, well, you can't show up and play them without knowing why you lost that one, right? So, you know, it, it, the mistakes that you've made in that game, you have to do the hard stuff and watch that game and study that game to not make those mistakes over and over again just because you weren't brave enough to face it. So she came down to the office. I brought her down to the office and we sat down, we watched that game together. Wow. Right, and you gotta, you gotta deal with Face it. Face it. Gotta deal with it. Face it, learn from it. When you play for 20 years, I play for 20 years, you reach a certain level, you're like, okay, wait a minute, I have to 
start again at the base of a mountain and try to climb the top of this mountain. First of all, what mountain am I climbing? I don't even know, like, what the hell am I going to be doing? And yeah. it'd be, it's very, it's very scary. Mm. It's very scary. Even for you? Oh, absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. And the thing that helped me actually was hurting my Achilles because that forced me to sit there and say, okay, the day could be today that your career is over. Now what do you do? You have these ideas about doing something with your life after basketball, but what if today is the day that you, that's it. Now what do you do? So I had all this time sitting there with my Achilles injury and contemplating and thinking, and I said, I better get to work. <laughs> wow. And that was that. The mentality book is, is really about um, process and craft. I've broken the book up into two sections. And process is really about the process of preparing, mm -hmm. you know, through injury, recovery, uh, studying of the game. And then the craft is the actual performance and the tactics. And so a lot of things that I learned uh, through the game were through photos. You can look at a photo wow. and see like a player making a move, look at the angle of his feet, look how he's using his hands on defense. And I can really break down things to the smallest detail through that. And that's what you'll see in this book. I mean, it's really a basketball Bible. You'll see how I break things down, like how I'm looking at things to the smallest of detail. Yeah. And uh, that's the best way to understand how to have that kind of mentality is to ask questions, and then find answers. And mm. then that lead to more questions, and you find more answers. And that's what yeah. the book is. So how can we teach our children what it means to work hard? Well, you do it through training, right? So when I get up in the morning, my daughter goes with me. 4 a.m.? 4 a.m. My 15-year-old goes with me. She wow. goes with me before school, and it becomes a daddy-daughter thing. That's cool. She just got her permit. Right, so she drives in the morning, it becomes a cool thing, right? But through that process, she understands the value of hard work and things taking time. And the same thing with my 12 year old, right? She practices every day, right? And so it's through those behaviors um, um, is where I find the motivation to mm. do it. I found that nothing in life is worthwhile unless you take risks, nothing. Nelson Mandela said, there is no passion to be found playing small and settling for a life that's less than the one you're capable of living. Now, I'm sure in your experiences in school and applying to college and picking your major and deciding what you want to do with life, I'm sure people have told you to make sure you have something to fall back on. Make sure you got something to fall back on, honey. But I never understood that concept, having something to fall back on. If I'm going to fall, I don't want to fall back on anything except my faith. I want to fall forward. I figure at least this way I'll see what I'm going to hit. Fall forward. This is what I mean. Reggie Jackson struck out 2,600 times in his career, the most in the history of baseball. But you don't hear about the strikeouts. People remember the home runs fall forward. Thomas Edison conducted 1,000 failed experiments. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Because the 1,001st was the light bulb. Fall forward. Every failed experiment is one step closer to success. You've got to take risks, and I'm sure you've probably heard that before, but I want to talk to you about why that's so important. First, you will fail at some point in your life, accept it. You will lose. You will embarrass yourself. You will suck at something. There's no doubt about it. And I know that's probably not a traditional message for a graduation ceremony, but hey, I'm telling you, embrace it because it's inevitable. And I should know. In the acting business, you fail all the time. Early on in my career, I auditioned for a part in a Broadway musical. Perfect role for me, I thought, except for the fact that I can't sing. So I'm, I'm in the wings, I'm about to go on stage, but the guy in front of me, he's singing like, like, like Pavarotti. He's just, and he's just going on and on and on. And I'm just shrinking, I'm getting smaller and smaller. So they say, oh, thank you very much, thank you very much, and you will, you'll be hearing from us. So I come out with my little sheet music and it, it was, it was uh, just my imagination by the Temptations. That's what I came up with. So I hand it to the, 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 the accompanist and uh, she looks at it and looks at me and 
looks out at the director and was like, nice. So I, I start, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to sing. I'm like, you know, this is my imagination once again. And then coming away with me. And I'm not saying anything, so I'm thinking I'm getting better. So I, I just start getting into it. It was just my imagination. Running. This all over your, uh, thank, yeah, thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Washington, thank you. So I assumed I didn't get the job. But the next part of the audition, he called me back. The next part of the audition is the acting part of the audition. Now I'm like, hey, okay, maybe I can't sing, but I know I can act. So they pair me with this guy, and again, I didn't know about musical theater. And musical theater is big, so they can reach everyone all the way in the back of, of the stadium. And I'm more from a realistic, uh, naturalistic kind of acting where you, you know, you actually talk to the person next to you. So I, I don't know what my line was. My line was, well, hand me the cup. And his line was, well, I will hand you the cup, my dear. The cup will be there to be handed to you. I, I said, oh, okay. <laughs> Well, should I give you the cup back? Oh, yes, you should give it back to me because you know that is my cup and it should be given back to me. I didn't get the job. But here's the thing. I didn't quit. I didn't fall back. I walked out of there to prepare for the next audition and the next audition and the next audition. I prayed, I prayed, and I prayed, but I continued to fail, and fail, and fail, but it didn't matter, because you know what, there's an old saying, you hang around the barbershop long enough, sooner or later you're going to get a haircut. So you will catch a break, and I did catch a break. Last year. I did a play called Fences on Broadway. Someone talked about it. Won the Tony Award. I, and I didn't have to sing, by the way. <laughs> but here's the kicker. It was at the court theater. It was at the same theater that I failed that first audition 30 years prior. The point is, every graduate here today has the training and the talent to succeed. But do you have the guts to fail? Here's my second point about failure. If you don't fail, you're not even trying. I'll say it again. If you don't fail, you're not even trying. My wife told me this great expression. To get something you never had, you have to do something you never did. Les Browns, a motivational speaker, he made an analogy about this. He says, imagine you're on your deathbed and standing around your deathbed are the ghosts representing your unfulfilled potential. The ghost of the ideas you never acted on. The ghost of the talents you didn't use. And they're standing around your bed, angry, disappointed, and upset. They say, we, we came to you because you could have brought us to life, they say. And now we have to go to the grave together. So I ask you today, how many ghosts are going to be around your bed when your time comes? You've invested, you, you've invested a lot in your education and people have invested in you. And let me tell you, the world needs your talents, man, does it ever. I just got back from Africa like two days ago, so if I'm rambling on, it's because I'm jet lagged. I just got back from South Africa. It's a beautiful country, but there are places there with terrible poverty that need help. And Africa is just the, the, the tip of the iceberg. The Middle East needs your help. Japan needs your help. Alabama needs your help, Tennessee needs your help, Louisiana needs your help, Philadelphia needs your help. The world needs a lot and we need it from you. We really do, we need it from you young people. I mean, I'm not speaking for the rest of us up here, but I know I'm getting a little grayer. We need it from you, the young people. So you gotta get out there, you gotta give it everything you got, whether it's your time, your talent, your prayers, or your treasures, because remember this, you will never see a U-Haul behind a hearse. You will never see a U-Haul behind a hearse. 
You can't take it with you. The Egyptians tried it. And all they got was robbed. So the question is, what are you going to do with what you have? I'm not talking about how much you have. Some of you are business majors, some of you are theologians, nurses, sociologists, some of you have money, some of you have patience, some of you have kindness, some of you have love, some of you have the gift of long suffering, whatever it is, whatever your gift is, what are you going to do with what you have? All right, now here's my last point about failure. Sometimes it's the best way to figure out where you're going. Your life will never be a straight path. I began at Fordham University as a pre-med student. I, 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 I took a course called the car, cardiac morphogenesis. I still can't say it. It's ca cardiac, cardiac morphogenesis. I couldn't read it. I couldn't say it. I sure couldn't pass it. <laughs> so then I decided to go into pre-law, then journalism. And with no academic focus, my grades took off in their own direction. Yeah, down. I was a 1.8 GPA one semester, and the university very politely suggested that it might be better to take some time off. I was 20 years old, I was at my lowest point. And then one day, and I remember the exact day, March 27, 1975, I was helping my mother in her beauty shop. My mother owned a beauty shop up in Mount Vernon. And there's, there was this older woman who was uh, considered one of the elders in the town and I didn't know her personally but I, I was looking in the mirror and every time I looked at the mirror I could see her behind me and she was staring at me she just kept looking at me every time I looked at her she kept giving me these strange looks so she finally took the dryer off her head and said to some, she said something I'll never forget first of all she said somebody give me a piece of paper give me a piece of paper she said young boy I have a prophecy a spiritual prophecy she said, you are going to travel the world and speak to millions of people. Now, mind you, I'm 20 years old. I'm flunked out of school. In fact, like a wise ass, I'm thinking to myself, maybe she's got something in that crystal ball about me getting back into school next fall. But maybe she was on to something because later that summer, while working as a counselor at a YMCA camp in Connecticut, we put on a talent show for the campers. And after the show, another counselor came up to me and asked, had you ever thought about acting? You're good at that. So when I got back to Fordham that fall, I got in and I changed my major once again for the last time. And in the years that followed, just as that woman prophesied, I have traveled the world and I have spoken to millions of people through my movies. Millions who up till this day couldn't see me, I, who, who up till this day I couldn't see while I was talking to them and they couldn't see me, they could only see the movie. They couldn't see the real me. But I see you today. And I'm encouraged by what I see. And I'm strengthened by what I see. And I love what I see. The word yoga means union. Union means whether you are aware of it or you are not aware of it, right now you are happening here as a part of everything else. What the trees exhale, you are inhaling. What you exhale, the trees are inhaling. Not just on the level of respiration, on all levels this is happening. What you think as myself is just a psychological boundary that you have set up. So yoga means consciously obliterating the boundaries of your individuality. So if you sit here, if you experience everything around you as myself, this is yoga. If you experience all this as myself, do you need morality? Be good to people, don't harm them, don't do this, don't do that, would it be necessary? No. Did anybody teach you out of these five fingers, this is a small finger, don't cut it off? Is there a morality needed like that? Anything that you feel is a part of yourself, with that you don't need any values, ethics, morals, nothing because it's a part of you. This is what yoga means, you experience everything as a part of you. When somebody experiences the whole universe as a part of himself, then we say he is a yogi. Charles Darwin said that you evolved out of a monkey. You are a monkey, 
then you became a man. Some of the genetic scientists are saying this, that the difference, the DNA difference between a chimpanzee and you is only 1.23 percent. So in that sense, physiologically you're only 1.23 percent away from a chimpanzee. Not a big difference, isn't it? A shade, it's just a shade of difference. But in terms of intelligence and awareness, you are worlds apart from a chimpanzee. So your problem is just this, you have an intelligence for which you don't have a stable enough platform and that's why yoga, to create a stable platform so that your intelligence works for you. Right now, you may call it so many things, so many exotic names have come up, stress, tension, anxiety, depression, madness, all kinds of things. All this essentially what it means is, your intelligence has turned against you, that's all. You can give any number of reasons, but essentially your intelligence has turned against you. If your intelligence was working for you, would you create blissfulness or misery? Bliss. This is all. Why your intelligence has turned against you, there's no stable enough base. So the entire yogic system is about this, that you create a stable base so that your intelligence works for you. If your intelligence turns against you, no power in the universe is going to save you, you are a done thing. If you become what you make up, unfortunate, isn't it? Hmm? Yeah. Your thoughts belong to you or you belong to the thoughts, you must make up your mind. They can be dangerous, those thoughts. They're not dangerous, they're fantastic. Only thing is, fantastic things mishandled can kill you. A car can kill you, isn't it? It's a wonderful thing, an automobile. It's made our lives. If you handle it irresponsibly, it kills you. Every possibility is like this. Every possibility, if you do not harness it, it becomes a problem. So the same goes for your cerebral capability. If you do not harness it, it's a serious problem. It's taking away eighty percent of the human beings are simply suffering. They don't need any outside help. They're on self-help. To understand when I say I'm thinking this, you… another word, another way of saying it is, I'm making up this, I'm making up that. You can make up whatever you want, as long as you enjoy it. To transform your life, you want to do it in two minutes. So is that what your life is worth? So if your life is worthwhile, is it not important that you invest a certain amount of time and energy, rather than looking for this stupid stuff of one mantra with which I will transform my life? It will not happen like that. That's the reason why most people have remained the way they have remained, because they've not invested in their well-being. So it's a serious long-term investment. It is not long-term. I would say, if I ask you, is your life worthwhile enough to invest thirty to thirty-two hours of focused time to bring some basic transformation within you? If I teach you a way where you can manage your chemistry the way you want, but we need thirty-two hours of focused time, do you think your life is valuable enough for that much investment, I'm asking? Yes then you must invest, that's what is called in an engineering program. It's thirty-two hours of focus time. We can format it in different ways, but that much investment has to go in. See, all human experience comes from within, isn't it? I don't know what kind of geniuses thought these things. I know in America there must be a million books telling you how to, uh, you know, milk happiness from something else or somebody else <laughs> but. All human experience is generated from within. What comes from within you must be the way you want it, isn't it? Isn't that simple enough, I'm asking? What comes from around you may not be the way you want it, but what comes from within you must be the way you want it. If whatever happens within you the way you want it, will you be blissed out or miserable? Blissed out. See, most people understand complexity as intelligence. If they make themselves difficult, they are supposed to be intelligent. Making a simple thing difficult 
is not intelligence. Making a very complex thing simple is intelligence, isn't it? So wrong sense of intelligence, idea of intelligence has entered people's minds. They think if they make a problem out of every solution, they're intelligent. No, no. If you find solutions for every problem, that is intelligence. That's my understanding. So essentially, this whole this whole attitude and questioning and this kind of thing has happened to the world in a big way because our education is confusing people to make them believe that memory is intelligence. Memory is not intelligence. Memory is useful as data, but intelligence is a different dimension. We have gobbled this up that we have made children believe from a very early age, if you remember something, you are smart. No, no, a tape recorder can remember everything. This camera can remember everything. This doesn't mean it's intelligent. So, one major aspect of my work is to separate these two. In your… within your experience, your memory and your intelligence are two different things. If you have an intelligence which is unsullied by memory, you will see everything just the way it is. But if you look at everything through the filters of your memory, everything is prejudiced. People who ask, all this is fine, but what's the takeaway? They want a commandment. We are talking about consciousness. Commandments won't fly. Commandments means you're trying to fix your life. Consciousness means you want to liberate your life. My intention is you must liberate your life. People come and say, Sadhguru, please teach us how to control my mind. Say, you want your mind controlled or liberated? Oh, yes, yes, liberated, but how to control? because they think that intelligence is a serious problem and it's been in their lives. So what is the solution? If you remove a part of your brain, you will be fine. <laughs> You're es essentially complaining, I wish I had the brain of an earthworm, this human brain I am not able to handle. Yes, that is a fact. We have come to a place where to grow our food, we need chemicals. To be healthful, we need chemicals. Today, seventy percent of the population is on prescription medication of some sort. To be peaceful, we need chemicals. To be joyful, we need chemicals. To be ecstatic, of course, you have ecstasy. So we are going towards chemicals in a huge way. The water that you drink is full of chemicals, the air that you breathe is like that, and the food that you eat is like that. So if ninety percent of humanity goes into chemical consumption, consciously or unconsciously, if they consume a lot of it, the next generation that we produce will be of a lesser quality than who we are. That's a crime against humanity. What I am saying is, the important thing about life, whether it's a grasshopper out there or you, both of us are striving to be the fullest possible life that we can be. A grasshopper is trying to be a full-fledged grasshopper, a human being is trying to be a full-fledged human being. So suppose you cut off one of grasshopper's legs which is supposed to hop, the hopping leg if you take it off, have you enhanced its life, I'm asking you? No. So similarly for a human being, if you take away any of his faculties in any way, even temporarily, have you enhanced his life? No. So intoxication is just that. It is taking away your faculties for a period of time, but if you continuously do it, it'll take it away for your life. So you're taking away or subjugating your faculties for a little bit of pleasure, or maybe a lot of pleasure, whatever, however you wish to describe it. But the important thing is you're taking a backward step with life, because life can only be enhanced by sharpening and increasing our faculties, not by decreasing our faculties. Our ability to be active, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, if this is in any way crippled, this means we are taking a backward step, though there may be pleasure attached to it. Every human being wants his life enhanced. If you don't show them proper ways to enhance, they will find shortcuts. See, a man who goes to the bar and a man who goes to a church or a temple or whatever, they're seeking the same thing, they're trying to enhance their life. Isn't it? If you do not show them a proper way, they will take whatever ways are available on the street, that's all. 
That's why I'm saying it's not a moral issue for me. It is just that it sets you backward. You want to go forward, but it sets you backward. Most people can't concentrate because they've never been taught how to concentrate and they don't practice it. So if we don't learn to concentrate and we don't practice it, well, obviously you can't practice something you haven't learned, then how can you be good at it? And what we practice all the time is distraction. So the more you practice distraction, the better you become at it. And people are masters at distraction. People think technology is distracting. You know, I've had so many people come up to me, hold their cell phones up to my face and go, these things are ruining our lives. And I go, no, these things are not ruining our life. This is a beautiful piece of technology. What's ruining your life is your inability to exercise discipline around the use of it. So the idea is that you use technology as opposed to technology uses you. In the same way, you know, if you look at your whole day, how do we integrate the practice of concentration throughout everything that we do? The one way I tell people to practice concentration is doing one thing at a time. So giving someone your undivided attention is a great way to practice concentration. Every time I speak with my wife, I give her my undivided attention. If my awareness drifts away, I bring my awareness back to her and I stay focused on that conversation. The two things we need to understand, there's the mind and there's awareness. And you're not the mind, rather your pure awareness moving through different areas of the mind. So your mind doesn't move, rather your awareness is moving through the mind. So when I'm speaking with my wife, if I'm getting distracted, it's my awareness is leaving her and it's moving to a different area of the mind. I might be thinking about a client or a contract I need to sign or a business opportunity, and then I bring my awareness back to her. We keep chatting for a minute and then my awareness drifts away again and I bring my awareness back. So I define concentration as my ability to keep my awareness on one thing for an extended period of time until I can consciously choose to move it to another thing. So if I'm speaking with you, I give you my undivided attention, I keep my awareness on you. Every time it drifts away, I bring it back. It drifts away, I bring it back, and I train myself. And I think that's where, you know, people in today's world, I feel so many people are lazy and they want a quick fix. Because everything that's being sold to them is a quick fix, you know. You only need to do so many hours before you get certified as a yoga teacher. You can come to the weekend course to enlightenment. That's a one-week seminar to understand mind-body connection. I'm like, what BS? I have up 10 years of my life learning this, and the way my teacher taught me was just like wax on, wax off, just one little thing at a time. A relentless practice. You First, you understand how it works. Then you learn how to practice it. And then you just repeat that mindlessly till it becomes numb. And everybody wants new things, right? They're tired. It's like, I'm done with part one. Can you give me part two? What's next? You know, it becomes like cocaine. Everybody wants to learn, but nobody practices anything. And they think by learning something, you're actually maturing or becoming wiser. No, learning doesn't make you wiser if you don't implement anything that you're learning. Absolutely. So people are going from one course to another, to another, to another. And then people in my industry, the self-help industry, that's how they make the money, right? You keep selling your shit. Yep. over and over again and you just keep buying and you think you're learning and growing but you're not because okay. you don't even practice the first thing you do you're taught so for me the first thing you want to learn is concentration because if you can't concentrate you can't solve problems you can't be better at what you do how can you be a great athlete how can you be a great singer an artist a scientist a doctor if you can't stay focused long enough to gain mastery over mm. the topic mm. where awareness goes energy flows. And a simple analogy I always tell people to look at awareness as a glowing ball of light. Your awareness is a glowing ball of light that's floating through the mind. And you can control where it goes. And there's different areas of the mind. There's an angry area of the mind. There's a healthy area of the mind. There's a science and sex and food and photography. And if your awareness is going to a particular area of the mind, that's where energy is flowing. Because where awareness goes, energy flows. And energy is like water. If whatever I water will start to grow. Right? So if I took a watering can and I watered a garden bed, would the weeds grow or the flowers grow? Both, right? Because mm -hmm. water can't tell the difference. Energy works the same way. If I put energy to a particular area of my mind, it will start to grow. So if I want to develop a particular area of the mind, all I need to do is harness my awareness, take it to that area of the mind, and hold it there long enough so there's enough energy going to that area, and that area starts to get strengthened. And, and different people cultivate different areas of the mind. Some people are happy. They're always happy. They're always an optimist. 
because that's where the awareness is going. And because awareness goes there, energy flows there, more energy is deposited there, more energy deposited there means more magnetic, which means it pulls awareness there much easier. The, the mind basically has no ability to tell what's good for you and what's not good for you. If the mind actually knew, we'd all be perfect. I'd wake up in the morning, my mind would tell me, meditate for an hour, do yoga, run, work out, eat this breakfast, then sit down for two hours or one hour, then stretch, then do this. No, my mind just is like, do whatever the hell you want to do. The mind doesn't know, right? So whatever we tell our mind, whatever we repeat over and over in our mind creates patterns. And these patterns, when they're repeated, whether they're repeated consciously or unconsciously, become deeply ingrained and become extremely difficult to break. He said, learn to lean on your own spine. And in the monastery that I lived in, there were 27 monks. And you know, in the 52 years he taught, he, he had 27 monks when he died. So it wasn't easy to get in. He was a tough teacher, a very loving, wise teacher, and wasn't easy to stay in. But, you know, the one thing he always said to us is that don't lean on me because one day when I die, you're going to fall over. Learn to lean on your own spine. And I think in today's world, people lean on so many things, right? Whether it's drugs or technology and we just complicate things right for for thousands of years i believe people learn to become sensitive to their mind their body and their nervous system and that's how we survived on this planet all over the world whether it was in europe africa asia people went out to the forest they knew what leaf or root or plant heal something and that's how we survived right there was no doctor or pharmacy to go to we understood our body, we knew how to connect with plants, with things, we were sensitive enough. And now in today's world, we are the most amazing tool on the planet, our body and our mind. But yet we don't try to understand it ourselves. We need technology to tell us about our body. We need other things to tell us about our mind, right? Get to know your mind, get to know your body so that you can understand it. And we have the most amazing tool in the world yet we turn to other things like technology and drugs and everything. Why? Just go within yourself and find out all answers are inside of you. So one common thing people say to me is, Tanapani, if I meditate five minutes a day in the morning, will that help me concentrate? Two things here. One is meditation doesn't help you concentrate. This is a total false, erroneous belief. Concentration leads to meditation. You cannot meditate unless you can concentrate. So meditation doesn't help you concentrate. Second is, look at it this way. Your whole day is a preparation. At first, your rituals throughout the day is what supports you. Then you start meditation, right? You, you can't meditate for five minutes a day and then the rest of the day practice distraction. Don't lead a life that supports meditation. My guru had a beautiful saying and he quite often would say that, you know, most people can't meditate because they do not lead a life that supports the practice of meditation. One of the brilliant things about my teacher was that he proved to us and showed us that technology and material things are not bad. There's nothing wrong with TV. There's nothing wrong with the cell phone. There's nothing wrong with computers. There's nothing wrong with the internet as long as you are in charge. But if you allow the internet, whatever's happening on your computer, on your phone, to dictate your awareness in your mind, then you become a slave to technology and then it can train you to be distracted. But as long as you're in charge of it, then it's totally fine. What beautiful tools, huh? I can pick up my phone and FaceTime my mom in Australia. I can see her, I can talk to her, I can smile and laugh. Why is that a bad thing? But I need to be in charge of my phone and I think in today's world, we allow everything on the phone, everything on the computer, on the internet, to dictate where our awareness is going, and therefore we become a slave to everyone and everything around us. Problems are not problems. They're subconscious patterns that need to be adjusted. And I love that saying, problems are not problems. They're subconscious patterns that need to be adjusted. And once you understand that, all you have to do is adjust patterns in your subconscious, and you can change so much in your life. Because so much of the patterns in there were either placed in there by you, or your surroundings, your family, your school, what you watch on TV, what you listen to, your environment, programmed to subconscious. So if you can adjust those patterns to what you want, you solve the problem. I think at the end of the day, it's all about desire. How badly do you want it? 
And most people, to be honest with you, don't want it badly enough. And when my guru asked me, when I told him I wanted enlightenment or self-realization, he asked me, what are you willing to do for it? And I said, I'm willing to give up my life. So I was willing, you know, in my early 20s, when all my friends were graduating from engineering school with me, they were going out and parties and shagging women and getting drunk and, you know, earning money, buying a car, getting an apartment, traveling the world. I said no, because I wanted something more. Not that I didn't think those things were great. I wanted something more. And I think today, you know, how many people really want to be concentrated? I would say there's so many incentives for concentrating, right? Benefits for concentration. Number one is that ultimately I would like to think that most people want to be happy. I think very few people wake up and say, I want to be miserable today. Most people want to be happy. How do you be happy? First, you become clear of what you want in life. You identify your purpose in life. You identify who and what is important in your life. Your purpose defines your priorities. Once you identify who and what's important in your life, then when you're doing what you love, when you're spending time with the people that you love, how do you get the most out of it? So if you love going to the gym and working out for an hour, how do you get the most out of it? You get the most out of it by being able to be concentrated while you're doing that. So if I'm, if I love spending time with my best friend and having a glass of wine with him and sitting with him for an hour and chatting gives me tons of joy and that's a priority in my life. The only way I can get the most out of the experience is learning how to concentrate. If I can give him or her my undivided attention for an hour, I can get the most out of that experience. The byproduct of that is I feel happiness, right? At the end of the day, if you really want to have a life that's a happy life, you really have to be clear who and what's important in your life. And in doing those things, you have to be fully present. And the only way to be fully present so that you can fully experience those experiences is to be able to be concentrated. Your brain is the most powerful weapon in the world. Once you put away your phones and your computers and all that we have nowadays, yeah, it's great. We're up to date, we, you know, you, but your brain is the only thing you have when you're going through depression, when, you, when you're going through hard times, you're going through death, real life sh You can't Google that, man. You're alone. You're alone. You may have a shrink you're going to, you may have a best friend you're going to, but there's 24 hours in the day where you're alone in this brain. And your brain is talking to you in all kinds of ways. And it wants to control you and pull you in these different pockets. If you can't control your own brain and your brain controls you, you're you got to tell your brain where you want to go and how you want to go and how you want to get there. You got to control it. If not, it's over. What existed for me was, okay, man, how am I going to make this work? And, I, and all I knew back then was hard work. The only way anything gets accomplished. That's all I heard back in those days. You got to work hard. You got to work hard. I'm not getting how to... I can't get this paragraph. I can't remember what the f in this paragraph to pass this test to get in the military. Read again. Still not getting it. Read again. But if you're not getting it, write it out. And that's how I started learning. Okay, well, I can't. I got to write out everything I do. And then write it out again. And write it out again. And guess what happened? I got it. I got it. I can't swim. I'm negative buoyant. Go back again. I can't swim. Go back again. Go back again. Go back again. I got it. I realize if I keep going back and going back and going back until the sh just becomes, your mind was safe. Okay, we're gonna figure it out because he is not going to stop. It's not like I'm gonna try one more time. No, I'm gonna. It's just like alarm clock goes off. Boop. We're going back. I can't read right. We're going back. I gave myself no way out, and my mind realized that. They said, okay, we're going to adapt and overcome now. Like, a lot of people say, trying hard. They, your mind knows, man. It knows this guy's bull me, man. This guy's lying. There's no truth behind it. When I was in Navy SEAL training, people would go, how were you there for 18 months? The program was only six months long. You were in three hell weeks in one year. No one's ever done that. How did you do that? I talk about the new norm. When I lived in a seven dollar a month place and I was growing up for a short period of time, I loved it. I didn't know any, I, I didn't know any different. That was my norm. 
Once we moved out of that place, we moved to a $236 a month place. I was like, Shit, I never want to go back to that little piece of shit. But if you go back to that $7 a month place and you realize this is where I live, this is all I got. Your mind says, Roger that, this is home. So when I was going through Navy SEAL training for 18 months and going back through all the hard parts over and over again, I told myself after the first time, I knew it was gonna be a long journey there. My body was breaking down. It was, it was just how it was going on. I said, you know what, this is my new norm. So my mind said, it's like going to work. Like you go to work, you put your suit and tie on, I go into suffering every day. Every day suffering, being broken, duct taping my feet up, stress fractures, shin splints, being broken. This is my new norm. And your mind says, if we're not broken, this ain't normal. We gotta be broken. So then your mind starts to get tougher and tougher and more callous. People go, how, how did you run on broken feet? Broken, broken shins. My mind knew this is how we operate. We're in, we're in Navy SEAL training. This is what we are. I became hell. And that became my new norm. I gave myself no way out. There was nothing outside these walls of hell. Nothing. I became, I love God, but for a short period of time, I became the devil because that was hell. I became, I became the boss, the owner, the CEO of Navy SEAL training. That was my mindset. And that's how you get through things. You put yourself, you immerse yourself in wherever it is, and you become that. You become that and give yourself no way out. When I was 297 pounds and I was fat as hell trying to be a Navy SEAL, the scariest thing in the world to me, even to this day, was that that could have been the rest of my life. I thought then I was trying hard. That's the scariest thing in the world. I thought then, 297 pound, working for Ecolab, spraying for cockroaches, making a thousand dollars a month. I thought that was me at my 100% potential. Come to find out, a few years later, I wasn't anywhere near that. 106 pounds less, graduated Navy SEAL training, went on to do all these other things. Looking back on that, that was me trying hard. That's why people gotta understand, what is in us, we have no idea until we start trying hard. And I mean really trying hard, where you're obsessed with, hey, this is my new norm. My new norm is that, wow, this isn't always fun. It's not always meant to be fun. And that's when you know you're trying hard. People hear my story and think this guy is sadistic. I realized how the, how the brain works. I figured out how the brain works. I, I'm a scared kid and that's what gives me so much power. I had no foundation and I built this off of just researching the mind. The feeling you get is basically invincibility. You realize that you can't do it all the time. When you need to do it, I know I can go to a place that I can live in. And when you know that you can run on broken legs and you can do certain things that a lot of people can do, but they're not willing to do, this power, this sympathetic nervous system a fight or flight and you're fighting. It, it gives you this charge of energy of when you're sitting there at 3 30, 4 o'clock in the morning and you're duct taping your feet up because they're broken and you're doing it by yourself and you're going through arguably one of the hardest training in the world. And these guys, most of them are healthy and you're going through it broken and you are at a disadvantage, but you're still there. You can feed into that and tap into that for a lot of power. But if you look at it, well, I'm broken, man. Like, I'm not gonna make it. But if you look at it as, man, I'm broken and I'm still here. And I'm fighting and I'm gonna find a way to get through this. Because I have no other place to go. It gives you a lot of power. When things start to suck really, really bad, my brain, in a lot of people's brain, they don't, they, they don't go to your dad beating you up. Your brain says, we gotta get the out of here. This is miserable. So anger goes away a lot of times when you're suffering because your brain just says, we gotta run, we gotta go. 
So that anger is not popping up saying, oh, I want to show them. I want to show those people. No, there has to be a much deeper. If I say deeper, it has to be down to mineral, mineral soil. It has to be down to that nice mineral soil where nothing can burn. You can't burn dirt. So it has to be down that low that literally is something in you that's at the core of your soul. And, but, you, but you don't find it unless you spend a lot of time with what you want to be in life. You, I, I can't give that to you. Right. You can't give it to somebody. When, when you find your true passion in life, and my passion for me when like, oh, I want to be in I don't give a Navy SEALs, Army, I don't give a shit. I want to serve my country. I cared about, I want to be someone that I'm proud of. I want to look at myself in the mirror because I was so disappointed. That accountability mirror I talk about, I was so disappointed in what I saw every day. I wanted everybody to love David Goggins. And a lot of people did. I didn't love myself. But I knew a lot of us want to find peace first. So people say, man, you always talk about this suffering and pain. And I'm at peace right now because I went through that. You don't find peace first. If you do, Merry Christmas. More power to you. More power to you. I found peace on the opposite end of finding myself. And no one really finds himself without going through trials, tribulations, suffering, accountability. And accountability is suffering. Being accountable every day for doing right for yourself, for the people next to you, it's miserable, it's hard. So, you know, even the smallest details. Most of what people care about can be thought of as a skill, right? I mean, well-being is a, is a skill. Not suffering unnecessarily is a skill. Regulating, n noticing your emotional life and regulating negative emotion is a skill. The, the moment you begin practicing mindfulness, which is just, just learning to pay close attention to the nature of your experience, you're not adding anything to your experience, you're just noticing what it's like to be you moment to moment, but in a way that is not reactive. You're not grasping at what's pleasant or pushing what's unpleasant away. You're just, I mean, to make this concrete, I mean, let's say you have a fear of public speaking, right? So you, you, you're about to go down, uh, out on stage and you feel anxiety. The default state of someone who doesn't want to have that experience is one to, you know, in advance worry about that experience. I mean, the anxiety is kindled just by the mere thought of what you have to do. Then, once you feel the butterflies, you are at war with them, right? You, you contract, your mind contracts around it. Like I see people do this all the time. They're they're relaxed. I'm unhappy. You know, when am I? And you're, you're, you're talking to yourself. You're not noticing it because you're, the thoughts just come up from behind you as fast as, as, as they can. And they seem to be you, right? You're identified with each thought that emerges in consciousness. And most people live their lives as though there's no alternative. We're not given a rule book for how to operate a human mind, right? And there's no place in a normal education where, where, we're, uh, where it's even indicated that there's an alternative here. And... So we get, we kind of stumble out into adulthood, more or less assuming that we have, we'll always have the minds we have, and that really there's, you know, we, the only thing we can do to really upgrade our firmware is to just add new content. You know, we can read books, we can, we can uh, develop uh, interests, but there's nothing at the sort of root level of our emotional and cognitive life that can change. And so mindfulness is a way of kind of dropping a little bit lower and, and realizing, so in this case, if you're feeling anxiety, there's actually a, a place from which you can just feel it, right? And, and be actually indifferent to it or anything else you could be feeling. I mean, just, just notice that there's even a, an unpleasant sensation. I mean, first you can notice that anxiety isn't even that unpleasant. I mean, it's, it's so close to excitement in its actual physiology that really the difference between excitement and anxiety is more or less just the the, the framing. It's just the story you're telling yourself. You know, if you felt these these tingles uh, and this, you know, slightly adrenalized response right before, you know, you're about to go on a roller coaster, that's part of why you're going on the roller coaster. You like that experience, right? But the fact that you feel that way 
when you're about to have an interview or you're about to you know walk out on stage, that's intolerable, right? So just dropping back and, and realizing the, the power of the framing is, is, again, this is a skill that is a fairly esoteric one, but now you know many people are, are learning it, you know, the secret's out. Um, and it, it has immense utility because then you can realize that the the half-life of negative emotions is incredibly short. I mean, one, you could you can actually be psychologically free even in their presence, right? Your 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 freedom and your well-being isn't even predicated on getting rid of the physiology, right? Like it can it can still be there. But if you're not continually thinking about all the reasons why you should be anxious, the physiology dissipates very, very quickly. And that's true for anger, it's true for anything that, that is uh, classically negative. Now, if we're talking about a clinical depression, it's, it's useful to say that there's a physiology to this that you know, can be driven from below in a way that's not narrowly responsive to their thinking, right? So it's, it'll tend to produce uh, depressive thoughts and the depressive thoughts will tend to feed back on the state. Uh, and everything else that is good to do that people sort of lose their commitment to doing at the worst possible time should be done. I mean, you have to sort of get behind yourself and push to, to exercise and to socialize and to do things that you, know, you, you may not want to do because those are good for you and help, you know, break, can, can break you out of it. But the normal range of psychological suffering, you know, not clinical depression, but just feeling like, you know, life sucks and you're a failure and there's nothing, you know, it's like uh, you're just, it's, you're stuck. That is a story of telling yourself a story, you're thinking, and you can either become more and more mindful of that and interrupt that more and more, uh, and or, and it, and it should be and, you can reframe this continually and tell yourself a better story. Right? You can actually just engineer, you know, you, you can change the code that you're, that you're you know, uh, running moment to moment and I mean just you know, a very simple one which I you know I use and I actually recently recorded this in a lesson on the app you know just gratitude just thinking this is actually you know this particular maneuver is uh, I believe comes from Stoic philosophy I, I didn't actually get it from Stoic philosophy but this this sort of use of negative imagination where you think of all of the bad things that haven't happened to you, right? So if you're just, you know, if you're stuck in traffic, driving to the job that you don't like, and you're you're frustrated, uh, you can think of all the things that could happen to you, right? That haven't, and if any one of them happened to you, you would consider your prayers answered if you could just be returned to this moment, right? Like you haven't been diagnosed with cancer, right? You've got two young kids, say. You know, you want to live to see them grow up, and you could be the guy who today is going to find out you've got two months to live, right? And you have to, then the next two months is spent just unwinding your worldly affairs, right? You're not that guy, right? That hasn't happened to you yet. That's just more th thinking, but it can have a profound effect. You can, you can reframe your experience in a way that doesn't actually change anything material about your circumstance, and it can let the, the light in generic situation we want to find ourselves in more and more is to effortlessly cooperate with creative and happy strangers, right? I mean, there's seven billion of us. We, have, we need institutions and laws and norms uh, and ways of thinking that take the friction out of pleasurable and non-paranoid interaction with strangers. I mean, it's not just about having, you know, five or so close friends who's got, who have your back, right? I mean, you like clearly we're all on the same team on some basic level. And if we can't figure out how to build a civilization where everyone thrives to some degree, we'll have the world we currently have until it becomes unsustainable. And because I mean, we're in a situation now where I, I think it's reasonable to worry that our default state of partisanship and tribalism and rational fear of the incompatible aims of you know other groups and other people uh, 
is unsustainable in the presence of more and more destructive technology. I just think, I think we have to get our act together psychologically and socially in a way that we haven't yet. It may be useful to have a, a slightly delusional self-serving bias, right? To think you're coming off better than you are. Like it may give you more enthusiasm for your life and more confidence. But anything that's too out of register is just delusion, right? And other people notice and other people treat you like somebody who's just not tracking in a reality. Uh, and so I think we want our beliefs to be true in some basic sense. And therefore we want to be open to new evidence and better arguments perpetually, right? Because if, you're, if you close yourself off, if you say, well, listen, I'm done. I'm done thinking about reality and I know what's true. Then again, more, when more data comes in, you know, when something's surprising, when, when, when one of your intuitions proves to be faulty, if you can't error correct, again, you're just going to fall out of alignment with what's going on in the world and what with what other people think is true as well. So the, really the only mechanism we have to do that is human conversation. Right? We, we have to be open to having other people point out errors in our thinking. And, we ha in, in, and in the conversation we have with ourselves, we have to do likewise. Don't tell people what, they, what you know. Right. Keep them poor. But, you know, unfortunately, the poor will always be amongst us because it starts up here. It's, it's in their words, you know, and the words become flesh. But when they say, I can't afford it or I can't do that, they become what they say. And I made so many people, I, don't, I can't afford it. You think I made of money? My PhD daddy says, what do you think I am, made of money? I can't afford that. And my rich dad would say, that's why he's poor. Poor people say, I can't afford it. I can't do that. I don't have time because this is an escape. It's an escape, you know what I mean? It's easy to say, I can't afford it. Oh, I'm too tired. Oh, I can't go to the gym. When you could go to the gym, but no, I can't. Truth is, I'm just too lazy to go to the gym. A question opens a mind, a statement closes the mind. See, when you say, I can't afford it, your mind shuts down and you become what you say. But the thing is, is that we become creatures of our own habits. And until we break the habit, we don't change. Poverty is passed on. It's taught in your families. And middle class is taught in families. And so the people right now who are sitting at home <clears throat> who are struggling financially or worried about money or unhappy, they may be making a lot of money, but unhappy with what they're doing, it was probably taught to you. You know, your super ego was taught get a job, work hard, or you'll, or you'll never be rich, or the rich are evil, or whatever. If you're poor, you'll always be poor. Just like most pro athletes, you know, they make millions of dollars, and what, 65% are bankrupt five years later? It's because they come from poor families. Now you tell them that, they get very angry at you. It's not, it's the rich fault. You know, it's you guys ripped me off, and government ripped me off. But unfortunately, it's passed down genetically. That's the frightening thing. We've got to change what we teach our kids. So I remember raising my hand when I was nine years old, talking to my, ninth, my fourth grade teacher, and I said, you know, when am I going to learn about money? She says, the love of money is the root of all evil. We don't teach money at school. I said, why not? And she couldn't answer me. And she got very flustered. She says, go ask your father. He's, the, he's my boss. So my father was the head of education. PhD, all that stuff. I go home and ask him, I said, why don't we learn about money in school? And he looked at me and says, because the government doesn't let us teach that subject. The government tells us what we can teach and what we can't teach. And I thought that was strange. And I said, but aren't we going to school to learn about money? He says, no, your job is to get a job. I said, but you get a job to earn money. He goes, no, you're supposed to just get a job. I went, no, 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 no. Isn't the purpose of a job to earn money? He goes, you're correct. I said, so why don't I just learn about money? I can skip the job part, you know? And he got flustered and he said, look, if you want to learn about money, why don't you ask your best friend's father about money? So I asked him. He says, because Mike's father is an entrepreneur. And I said, what, am, what are you? He says, I'm an employee. I'm a government employee. And I went, oh, what's the difference? 
This is the differences an entrepreneur must know about money, or that they're no longer entrepreneurs. And it says an employee doesn't have to know anything about money, because the government will take care of them, the company will take care of money on one condition. And that condition was he would never pay me. He says, the moment I pay you, you think like an employee. He says, that's the trap. Entrepreneurs work for free. And now I'm nine years old, my head's going cracking in half. He says, you never want a paycheck. You understand that, kid? I said, okay, I got it. And he says, well, how do I make money? He says, that's what entrepreneurs figure out. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's the, it's the cat, you know, which just comes first, the cat or the, you know, the, the cat chasing its tail. I said, so how do I learn about money? So he would just break out a Monopoly game board. So I would work for free. I'd pick up cigarette butts and he had hotels and restaurants and I would clean and do menial tasks. And as I got older, I started getting into office work and marketing and accounting. And I was an apprentice basically, but I always worked for free. He says, that the moment you accept the paycheck, your brain goes dead. As long as you're hungry, you'll think. And he was a great, great teacher. You see, most teachers in school, they're out of ethics. They teach subjects they, don't, they themselves don't practice. A fake teacher is somebody who just wants a job and they'll teach anything. You know, they teach how to shine shoes if you pay them more money. But they really don't know what they're teaching. For example, my calculus teacher, I was at, went to military school in New York, and um, I asked the teacher, I said, you know, it's, I'm in my third year of calculus now. I said, am I ever going to use this stuff? He goes, no. You know, I said, why do you teach it? He says, because I get paid. I said, do you ever use it? He goes, no. And that's why, you know, I, you have to, in life, one of the things I suggest to people, you gotta find a real teacher versus a fake teacher. And a fake teacher is somebody who doesn't do what they teach. And a real teacher is doing what they teach every day. School systems are making our students weaker. So in school, they have these things called now trigger effects. So you can't, as a teacher, you can't say anything that might upset the student. They don't want anything that might jar their point of view. So if I went into school, I'd be thrown out because I threatened them. You know, and, and to me, isn't school about opening your eyes and minds to new ideas? But that's now out of the system. So everybody's got to be PC, you know, politically correct now. And it's killing us. It's killing the brains of our kids. They're going backwards. But in their minds, they're more enlightened. If I didn't have ideas that shook me, I wouldn't learn anything new. But now these trigger, trigger mechanisms, we're actually making our students weaker in school. My success comes from spirituality, not finance. You see people say, well, why don't you give the poor money? So the only problem with that is just creates more poor people. You give a man a fish, you get a lot of people who want more fish, you know? But you teach them to fish. We're more antagonistic, more antisocial. You know, social media is antisocial. That's the danger part. So the reason I'm speaking on spirituality, we gotta evolve. You know, it means meditation, it means yoga, it means praying, it means going to church, whatever it takes. But you gotta get back to calm and peace and meditation. One generalized principle is emergence through emergency. So when you look at the word emergency, the base word is emerge. The only way humans evolve is via emergency. And a big one's coming. And it's gonna be, as we all know, our banks have ripped us off immensely. They're just a bunch of crooks. I don't know how they can live with themselves. But you know, the bankers rip off trillions and they get bonus in billions. Nobody goes to jail. That's the sickness of our society. So that's why I write about financial education. It's almost like self-defense. It's almost like taking judo against our own government and our own banking systems and Wall Street. But people who are afraid of making mistakes like they teach in school, they don't ever grow. Because spirituality is there's good and there's bad, there's right and there's wrong, there's up and there's down. Most people only want to be right, they only want to be positive. Well, you can't have that, that's not reality. Well, every time I failed, it was like, good, I said, okay, what have I learned? And the average person, the reason they're poor is they haven't failed. 
you know, they play it so safe, they haven't made any mistakes like they're taught in school, that means they don't learn anything. That's why the school system's actually fundamentally corrupt. It's anti-education. Don't make mistakes and don't ask for help. And if I didn't ask for help, you know, I have my accountants, my attorneys, my bankers and all that, you know, I go into business like a rugby team. You know, boom, boom, and we kick butt. But the average guy is standing there, oh, I'm an A student, I'm, gonna, I'm going to do this all on myself, and a, and a bunch of rugby players run you over, and you go, well, they're not playing fair. Yeah, you know what, you're, not, you're playing stupid. You should have a team. You should have accountants, attorneys, and bankers, and all that stuff. But that's not the game I want to play. I said, then don't play the game. So what I say to young people is, you, know, you find your game. So I'm not here to tell you, don't do this, do that, don't do that, do this. I'm here to change the way you think. And if I can change the way you think, I can't help but change what you do, can I? Let me introduce you to the concept of success. Ben Franklin was a pretty smart guy, and I want to start with a quote by him. If you do tomorrow what you did today, you will get tomorrow what you got today. You want to know what that means? The average American makes between 3 and 5% more each year. That's the deal. And in today's economy, I'm not sure we're going to make the 3 to 4 to 5% next year as employees. So it takes you 20 years to double your income in America as an average person. That's the mediocrity that we're stuck in in life. And then you meet people who have the uncanny ability to double their income in a year, to get promoted five times in a year. The ones that beat the system, the ones that conquer it, You've all seen them, haven't you? The difference between them and the ones that don't do that is that they wake up in the morning and they think differently. They understand that if I do tomorrow what I did today, I'm gonna get tomorrow what I got today. You want a bigger car? How about a nice house in Tahiti? Sure, would you love a nice house in the hills? We all want better things, don't we? We all want more friends, more stuff, more money, more security, more travel, more enjoyment. If you do the same thing tomorrow that you did today, you're stuck, stuck, and it doesn't change. And it grows a little at a time, and you get a taste of success, but it's never fast enough. It never excites you. And when it does, it's a good month, or a good two months, or a good three months, but it doesn't provide a trajectory that creates success. So the first thing I want you to think about today is I want you to wake up tomorrow and do something different. And understand if you do the same damn thing, you're stuck. Just because you did it a certain way yesterday, there's no reason to do it that way today. I want it to hit hard. That's not what drives success, you do. There's no place for patience in business. You know, patience in life means things happen slower than they could. So if you're gonna be on this planet for 70 years and things happen slower than they should, at the end of 70 years, you're gonna have less, aren't you? Less experiences, less time, less money, less of everything. So let's all hurry up, man, and get more out of life. If you think your life is complete, then I suggest that you're an ass. Because tomorrow always has a great opportunity in it. Your life is not complete until you close your eyes. So when you say somebody who's in a job they hate would love to be able to do this, my comment is, why the hell are you in a job you hate? Don't you have the courage to leave it? So you're in a job you hate, you're doing nothing to change it, but you'd like better. Sometimes you have to they, do but better. they have mouths to feed, I, sometimes I get it. But what were the things about you? Listen, we'd have to go over those specific cases, I think, and really get into each person to break them. But what do you think that were the things about you? One of it is you always had your eyes open to tomorrow and new opportunities. What were some of the other things as part of your personality? For Because there aren't many people like you, but I've seen and I'm studying more and more people where amazing things are happening at 55 and 60 and putting them on life journeys that they never thought they were going to have. And I'm... And I'm seeing that you guys have a lot of the similar attributes, but what do you think? What was it about you, John? Courage. Courage. You know, the first time I went and shot a pilot for Bar Rescue was really hard. 
You think it's easy to scream at people on national television, to insult people on national television, to call you a jerk, challenge your marriage, challenge your, challenge your integrity, challenge your professionalism? That's hard. That's not who I am. I don't wake up and embarrass people in front of their friends, right. in front of their family. Bar rescue is the hardest work I have ever done. The courage that it takes for me to go out there and do these things. The only final advice I would give you is I've lived a very unconventional life. And it's because I live my dream every day. Dreams are inspiring. Work is not. Find a dream. Dreams make this world go on. It built our whole country. And when we get in a rut as human beings, is when we lose touch with our dreams. We lose the ability to fight for those dreams. So don't be an employee of Google. Live your dreams at Google. Find a way to, to you know, match your dreams with the goals of your company and your own work. Because there's nothing worse than when you see somebody who lost touch with their dreams. You wake up in the morning, you're failing. So you blame the president, you blame Congress, you blame Greece. Blame the euro. I mean, you, construction in the street, it's the mayor. Oh, it's the, the, and you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you're not failing because it's the other guy's fault. Or it's the economy's fault. But if you looked in the mirror and said, I'm failing because of me, you wouldn't like it. And you change that. And I believe the common denominator of failure in any business is excuses. As long as you wake up and blame poor sales on the economy or an environment, then you have no motivation to make it better because it's not your fault. But in the worst economic environment four or five years ago in this country that we've seen in our lifetimes, there were people making a lot of money, weren't there? In the height of that recession, there were people selling advertising, people opening restaurants, people building businesses. Somebody's making money. So the excuse is bull. It's bull. So wake up in the morning and own your failure. Look in the mirror and say, I'm failing because of me. And you won't like it. And then you'll change it. But as long as you don't put it on you, you have no motivation to change it. So in short, if you own your failure, you'll own your success. If you don't own your failure, you'll never dig out. And I find that in any business, always the common denominator of failure, personally, is excuses. You don't want to be a failure, do you? Not at all. You don't want to look in the mirror and, and experience that. If you can't blame anybody but yourself, you're going to change. You're going to fight it out. That's the deal. I have a dear friend who's, who works for a large company and he wants to open a franchise of, buy a franchise of sandwich stores. So he meets with me, he says, John, I need some advice. Do I leave my longstanding job and benefits and do this? Or do I, so why can't you have your cake and eat it too? Right. Why can't you bring in a partner? Why can't you bring in somebody to do it? There's ways to get there. It doesn't have to be absolute. So if somebody wants to create a second career, create new opportunities in their life, figure out a way to do it without risking what you have. Right. And so if you want it enough, you'll figure it out. I BS'd my way into jobs that I didn't have the experience to do and pulled it off. But I had to believe in myself to BS my way into it. And I knew I could figure it out too. Right. And that gave me the confidence to show up at the interview and convince that guy to hire me. Because I was convinced myself that I could do it. And that comes across. You got to wake up in the morning and drive revenue. Which means you got to have the promotions, the ideas, the energy to elevate a business. You got to be a rainmaker in business or you're never going to get anyone wet. And when they don't get wet, they dry up and go away. And it's that wetness of a rainmaker that filters down and trickles to everybody's success. You have to drive the energy of revenue to be successful. And when you do, you'll have no expense problems. I drive quality as a leader. My systems maintain quality. Now, with regard to new projects, to me, every new project is a ball. And I have to move that ball every day. So I know, for example, that I have four balls on my desk. They might be five pads, let's say five balls on my desk. They might be five different pads, five different books, five different projects. Every day, I'm gonna move those five balls. That's the way I live my life. And I can't go to sleep at night if I don't move every one of those five balls every day. Sometimes I have three balls, sometimes I have seven balls. But the amount of balls that I accept and put on my desk 
Every one of them is going to move forward every day. And I become relentless. So I've learned to live my life based upon the progress I make on a daily basis. And I believe that business is defined by what we do every day, every single day. And business is defined by the days that we have. So if you move those five balls every day, you can't help but be successful. You will achieve it, but you'll achieve it on a daily basis. It's an interesting concept because you have to think about this. So why is it that you can give someone a sugar pill, a saline injection, or perform some false surgery or treatment? And a certain percentage of those people will accept, believe, and surrender to the thought without any analysis that they're getting the real substance or real treatment. And they begin to program their autonomic nervous system to make their own pharmacy of chemicals that matches the exact same chemical or treatment that they think they're getting. Now, it says a few things. Number one, it's not the external substance that's doing the healing because it's inert. There's some type of innate capacity for the body to heal. And there's some correlation between the mind and the body. So that pill represents possibility for the person. And so if you think about this, when they see the pill, they're conditioned into thinking that that pill can do something good for them. So in a depression study, for example, three out of four people that are taking a placebo in a depression study get better. Now that's 75%, which means that when that person sees the pill, the pill represents hope, a possibility for them. They begin to select a new idea, a new thought, that they could be better, a possibility. It's called a clear intention. Some people will begin to become inspired, enthusiastic, excited. And when you combine that clear intention with an elevated emotion, you are changing a person's biology from living in the past to living in the future. And they begin to make their own pharmacy of antidepressants that begins to help them. Now, it's not a one shot deal because in those studies, for example, the person who's taking the placebo has to take that pill for six weeks or eight weeks. So every day, then, they're reminding themselves of a new future reality. And that, that pill represents a symbol. It represents a symbol of hope, a symbol of possibility. And instead of them relating to themselves in a limited way that they have to resign to the idea that they can't think greater than how they feel in a, in a depression study or feelings have become the means of thinking, they're actually changing their physiology by thought alone. And the redundancy and the repetition of that cycle begins to select different functions in the nervous system. And your nervous system is the best pharmacy or drug uh, producer in the world and begins to select new genes and, and uh, instruct new genes to cause a person's biology to begin to change. And if you keep knocking on the genetic door, there's a good possibility that you can program a gene or upregulate a gene to do something well and downregulate a gene to turn off. And so my interest is in understanding how the placebo works. How does it work? Once you understand how it works, Will you be able to teach it? Because do you need the sugar pill in order to move into a new state of being? Or can you teach a person to select an unknown instead of a known and continuously select that unknown and emotionally embrace that future before the event occurs, so much so that the body as the unconscious mind begins to believe it's living in that future reality in the present moment and if the person does that, just like taking the placebo for six weeks, alters their state of being every single day, is it possible that that unknown becomes a known and they begin to change their physiology and biology just by thought alone? You better be willing to have a new experience that is no longer a wishy-washy belief. It has to be 
a very strong impression in your biology it comes with an accompanying experience that then changes your biology to understand you believe something else. But that's not the end either, because then you have to question from that point, what is the next belief that helps you to understand the next thing? For example, the person in our work who, I'll use a simple example, has a uh, very, very difficult marriage and her marriage falls apart, her husband was abusive, and lived by the stress hormones for an extended period of time. Of course, all her energy is going for some threat in her external environment. She has no energy in, in her internal environment for growth and repair. No energy for long-term building projects. The, the body is in vigilance. It's, it's always anxious. She's anticipating something bad happening all the time, and she's got food allergies to everything. She's allergic to her environment. She comes to the event, she does the work, it takes her three months, and all of a sudden, in one event, she has a breakthrough, and she's eating anything she wants. Now, she's changed her belief about her past because she's no longer saying, I am this way because of my relationship with my husband. See, because when you say, I am this way because I had an abusive father, I am this way because I had a difficult marriage, I am this way because I got fired from my job, what you're saying is, I haven't changed since that event emotionally. And so now you're viewing your future through the lens of the past. When you overcome that emotional state, a memory without the emotional charge is called wisdom. Now you're ready to create a new future because if you're still attached to the emotion, you're still attached to the past and you can't create a future. So all of a sudden now the person has a transformation. She has a shift. She knows that she knows that she's liberated from that anxiety. She's, she feels it. And as a result of it, in a matter of moments, Ben, her biology reorganizes to a new mind. And now she's eating. I'm watching her eat pizza. I'm watching her eat a hamburger. I'm, she's laughing. She's, and, it's, and it's sustained. But that's not the end. Because if she's healed herself, then the next question is, I understand the physics and biology of what I've done. Is it possible if I heal myself that I can heal another person? If people are really, really believing that their astrological sign determines their destiny, then they will look for, based on their perception, the correlations that are equal to their belief system. I don't particularly believe that because I'm born at a certain time under a certain house that has anything to do with me creating the life that I want to have, right? So many people will though, and because they do, they'll only, they'll select like, oh, I saw 1111 on the clock. Well, well, you've seen three, 236 on the clock and 418 on the clock, but you're looking for 1111. Well, then that's your reality because that's where your attention is, right? So I don't subscribe to that, but I respect that because that person is going to keep that belief until it no longer serves them. And they're either going to evolve their belief or they're not. And if they don't, so be it. But if they do, they're going to realize sooner or later it's not working for them. I have certain beliefs right now that I honestly am questioning that I still think are limited beliefs. But in order for me to change those beliefs, I'm going to have to come out of my resting state, have to step out into the unknown and really check to see and execute in a very different way. I can tell you that there is a strong majority of people who are still taking the placebo, who are still making their changes. Because we know that like in a Parkinson's study, you give Parkinson's patients a placebo and more than 50% of them, their, their intention tremors go away. But if you take those people after they're making 200 times the amount of dopamine by getting a saline injection or an injection of distilled water, they're making their own dopamine. And Parkinson's is a deficiency in dopamine. When they return back to their life and they see their caregiver and they play chess with their friends and they see their wife or sleep in the same bed or whatever it is, their personal reality is creating their personality, reminding them who they are. Their disease comes back because they're back to the same identity. And that's how strong the environment is. So our <clears throat> students who continue to do the work are still getting, sustaining and producing more changes. Wow. Now that's the majority of our students because our students are committed. But we do have students that don't make it. Why? Because this is a, 
is we're doing something that is unknown. We're doing something. Not everybody is going to make that. Like not everybody's going to finish the mile. Not everybody's going to make the journey to the top of the mountain. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a journey. And so we ask people then, uh, the ones that have had chronic diseases or conditions, the majority of them, by the way, are still doing exceptionally well. Some of them have had a disease return. And what we have them do is measure. Every three months or six months, you measure. Why? Because this is not about denial. This is about knowing. So the people who have had some conditions return, we ask them to measure, and then we ask them to go at it again. And if their values aren't changing, we ask them to intervene with other medical means or whatever they need to, to, to improve. So the ones that have had the healings, though, the majority of them are still doing exceptionally well. Some of them that stop taking the placebo or get start, they lose their job, they lose their mother, they lose their life, and they get stressed, and they, they go back to their old self. Well, it's a matter of time when we're going to start seeing some of those conditions return. What happens if you take a cold shower every day? The heart rate is going to go down with 20, 30 beats a minute, 24 hours a day. That means stress is gone. If you take a couple of minutes and you make sure all the body adapts to the cold, because you know, you are very warm. You're warm like a hot dog right. in the, when you wake up. I go directly <laughs> straight to the cold and get the biggest of reactions on my body. And within 30 seconds or something, I'm completely not feeling the cold anymore. And then uh, two minutes later, I just finish it. It's okay. Doesn't need anymore. But what the importance of that in the morning is that you wake up your vascular system. And your vascular system is like two and a half times the world around in the length of the veins, arteries, and capillaries. Everybody has it. And it contains millions of little muscles and they are trained if you go in and adapt to a cold shower a day and that way your vascular system is optimized and then your heart doesn't need to pump so much because all these millions of little muscles they help the blood flow go through and they work with each other yes it's one closed system and the originator is the heart what happens if you take a cold shower every day? The heart rate is gonna go down with 20, 30 beats a minute, 24 hours a day. That means stress is gone. This is what we do. It's a hormetic exercising, hormetic stress exercising is a cold shower. Cold shower a day keeps the doctor away. What happens more is that the blood flow runs much better through the system. Mm -hmm. The nutrients, vitamins, and minerals, and oxygen, they get better to the cells. It produces more energy. That's why everybody feels so energized directly after the cold shower. Because the system is getting better into feeding all the cells of ours, which makes up molecules, which is energy. You feel more energy. Now, uh, because uh, my vascular system is really trained, I just take the cold shower. And when I take my ice bath, which is even more colder, I say to the people, I recommend two minutes, but then uh, in, very soon you are able to go five minutes. And today, you and uh, me, we go for 10 minutes because we're going <laughs> to set our mind. The power of the mind is amazing. This is what I've been showing in the last study, to be able to make my skin temperature not going down while ice water gets on the skin just by using the mind. Isn't that amazing? And that means we are able to make stress go away just by using our mind. And this is the result after so much training and exposing myself into, into the cold that I've learned to awaken direct connections in the brain that enables me, just by thought, to make the difference in my body whenever there is stress. And that stress could be emotional, physical, bacterial, 
virus stress, uh, mental stress, daily stress, stress and congestions. Stress is stress. And uh, you are able just by using your mind to deal with that type or any type of stress. Mm. That, that is the message. You got oxidative stress and hormetic stress. Oxidative stress is negative. Uh, uh, that means that things you cannot handle and they get into the cell mechanisms and they uh, have an absolute negative uh, influence on uh, the cell uh, mechanisms and the mechanics and the telomeres, the longevity, the cell division, the, the DNA, and it uh, produces wrong genome expressions, which makes you sick or even cancer in the end. A stress is like an attack on our healthy mechanisms. And if we learn how to deal with stress, the healthy mechanisms stay healthy. That's the whole trick. And this is what we do right now with, in San Francisco with 140 people, with the top uh, researchers on the DNA to show how to protect the cell uh, by uh, exercising uh, the, the cold showers and the breathing exercises. Uh, exercises, they are into positive stress activation, which is hormetic stress. And that makes the cell protected by proteins around the cell like little guards, like little warriors who fend off viruses, bacteria, inflammation, and oxidative stress. So then the cell remains intact and the healthy production of the uh, mechanics of the cell, they are able to flourish and to keep on going. It's amazing what we found. Because of me doing a, a study, and I will show you the study, the first study, I, sh uh, I was staying like 80 minutes in uh, ice up till here. Uh, they took blood, like 36 of tubes out of my arm. While I was 80 minutes up till my neck in ice. And my core body temperature remained 37 degrees, 80 minutes long. And then they took the blood, and their blood, they injected E. coli ex vivo. So I was not there, but my blood was there. And normally you have a very violent reaction of the immune cells on the E. coli bacteria injected in the blood serum. And now there was zero reaction. They never had seen that. And then they said, can you do this when we inject you directly in <laughs> your uh, veins? I said, yeah, hey, let's try it on. <laughs> I think so. But I did not become sick. I did my breathing techniques. I mm. used my mind. Mm. And uh, mm. I did not become sick. I felt great. And they saw that I was influencing directly at conscious will the autonomic nervous system. Thought of inaccessible in uh, medical scientific literature that humans are able to do that. And I was uh, showing the contrary. So with that, uh, they said, yeah, uh, but you are the Iceman. You are a special. You are different. You are a freak of nature. This is <laughs> with normal people, not possible. And then I told them, yeah. yes, give me people for 10 days and I will make them able what science is saying that is not possible with the human physiology at will. I will make them able at will to influence so deep within their bodies. And uh, with that, we will change medical literature as it is. And they said, okay, finally, they said, yes, let's do it. And we did a comparative study with 18 people there who did not train with me and 18 people who I trained. 12 of them were randomly chosen to uh, take part of the injection of the E. coli bacteria. And all of them, non-trained and trained. The non-trained people, they uh, became all sick. Mm -hmm. And the trained people, after four, only four days of training, they did not become sick. And uh, uh, then they saw 16,134 people who had been exposed to the same experiment all became sick. And then suddenly 12 people, 
did 100% score in one competitive study uh, showed not to become sick. 100% score. What I do always with people is to go to the mountains. I have a, a house in Poland somewhere at the mountain slopes. And uh, I trained the people over there every day, uh, uh, inside and outside, in the snow, barefoot, in shorts, going to the waterfall, and uh, slowly but surely, in four days, climb a mountain in shorts for five hours in freezing temperatures and have a great time. Then, uh, when we arrived uh, on the top of the mountain, I knew these guys are ready. Let it come. Let the injection come of the bacteria. They will show the difference. And four days later, they were in the hospital, got the injection, and they mm. showed, turned around scientific lit uh, literature as it is. We are able to do so much more than has been uh, believed by science and scientific community. And we have to bring this to the people. I remember walking across this yard on what seemed to be a random day. My head down, lost in my own world of issues, like many of you do daily. I'm almost at the center of the yard. I raised my head and Muhammad Ali was walking towards me. Time seemed to slow down as his eyes locked on mine and open wide. He's raised his fist into a quintessential guard. I was game to play along with him, to act as if I was a worthy opponent. What an honor to be challenged by the GOAT, the greatest of all time for a brief moment. His face was as serious as if I were Frazier in the Thriller in Manila. His movements, his movements or flashes of a past greater than I can imagine. His security let the joke play along for a second before they ushered him away. And I walked away floating like a butterfly. I walked away amused at him, amused at myself, amused at life for this moment that almost no one would ever believe. I walked away light, ready to take on the world. That is the magic of this place. Almost anything can happen here. Throughout ancient times, institutions of learning have been built on top of hills to convey that great struggle is required to achieve degrees of enlightenment. Each of you had your own unique difficulties with the hill. For some of you, the challenge was academics. And I want to say something to that. You know, sometimes your grades don't give a real indication of what your greatness might be. For others, it was financial. You and your family struggled to make ends meet. You had to work an extra job or two, but you're here. For a lot of you, your hardest struggle was social. Some of you never fit in. You, you were never as cool and as popular as you wanted to be, and it, and it bothers you. So your social struggles here became psychological. Even though you made it up the hill, you carry the baggage of rejection with you, but you're here. Or some of you went through something traumatic. You made it to the top of the hill, but, but not without scars and bruises. Some of you fit in too much. You waited until the last minute to do your best work, and it's a wonder that you made it up the hill at all because you carry the baggage of too much acceptance. Most of you graduating here today struggled against one or more of the impediments or obstacles I mentioned in order to reach this hilltop. When completing a long climb, one first experiences dizziness, disorientation, and shortness of breath due to the high altitude. But once you become accustomed to the climb, your mind opens up to the tranquility of the triumph. Most of you need some realizations because Right now, you have some big decisions to make. Right now, I urge you, in your breath, in your, in your eyes, in your, in, your, in your consciousness, invest in the importance of this moment and cherish it. I, I know some of you might have partied last night. You should. You should celebrate, but this moment is also part of that celebration. 
So savor the taste of your triumphs today. Don't just swallow the moment whole without digesting what has actually happened here. Look down over what you conquered and appreciate what God has brought you through. I was on a roll when I entered the system of entertainment, theater, television, and film. In my first New York audition for a professional play, I landed the lead role. From that play, I got my first agent. From that agent, I got an on-screen audition. It was a soap opera. It wasn't Third Watch. It was a soap opera on a major network. I scored that role too. I felt like Mike Tyson when he first came on the scene, knocking out opponents in the first round. With this soap opera gig, I was already promised to make six figures, more money than I had ever seen. I was feeling myself. But once I got the first script and with soap operas, you very often get the script the night before and, and you shoot the whole episode in one day with little to no time to prepare. Once I saw the role I was playing, I found myself conflicted. The role wasn't necessarily stereotypical. A young man in his formative years with a violent streak pulled into the allure of gang involvement. That's somebody's real story. Never judge the characters you play. That's what we were always taught. That's, that's the first rule of acting. And any role play honestly can be empowering. But I was conflicted because this role seemed to be wrapped up in assumptions about us as black folk. The writing failed to search for specificity. Plus, there was barely a glimpse of positivity or talent in the character. Barely a glimpse of hope. I would have to make something out of nothing. I was conflicted. Howard had instilled in me a certain amount of pride. And for my taste, this role didn't live up to those standards. It was just my luck that after filming the first two episodes, execs of the show called me into their offices and told me, how happy they were with my performance. They wanted me to be around for a long time. They said, if there was anything that I needed, just let them know. That was my opening. I decided to ask them some simple questions about the background of, of my character, questions that I felt were pertinent to the plot. Question number one, where's my father? The exec answered, well, he left when you were younger. Of course. Okay. Okay. Question number two. In this script, it alluded to my mother not being equipped to operate as a good parent. So why, why exactly would, would my little brother and I have to go into foster care? Matter of factly, he answered, well, of course she's on heroin. That could be real, I guess. But I didn't want to assume that's what it was. If, if we're around here assuming that the black characters in the show are criminals on drugs and deadbeat parents, then that would probably be stereotypical, wouldn't it? That word stereotypical lingered. One of the execs pulled out my resume and began studying it. The other exec wore a smile trying to live up to what they had promised me only a few moments before. If there's anything you need, just let us know. She said, as, as you have seen, things move really fast around here. But we are more, more than happy to connect you with the writers if you have suggestions. Yeah, I said, that, that would be great. I said, because I'm just trying to do my homework on this. I, I, didn't, I didn't know if you guys had decided on all the facts, but maybe there's some things we could come up with, some talent or gift that we can build. Maybe he's really good at math or something. He has to be active. I'm doing my best not to play this, this character like a victim. So you went to Howard University, huh? The exec holding my resume interrupted, peeking over the pages. Yes, I said proudly. He slid my resume back in his desk and said, thank you for your concerns. We'll be watching you. I left the office. I shot the episode I had come in to shoot on that day. Probably the best one I did out of the three because I got what was bothering me off my chest. 
I was let go from that job on the next day. Phone call from my agent. They decided to go another way. The questions that I asked set the producers on guard and perhaps paved the way for a less stereotypical portrayal for the black actor that stepped into the role after me. As the scripture says, I planted the seed and Apollos watered it. But God kept growing. God kept it growing. Yet and still, when you invest in a seed, watching it grow without you, that is a bitter pill to swallow. A bitter pill. Anybody that's ever been fired knows what I'm talking about. Even if you really don't want the job, when they let you go, it's like any breakup. You act like you don't care. I didn't need that damn job anyway. I didn't need them. But when you have those moments alone, you start to wonder if there was a better way to handle it. And if you could have, if you could have handled it better, maybe you could help your family. And, and then before you know it, you're broke and you find yourself scraping together change just so you can ride the subway so that you can get the next job. And maybe if you could book something else, that would eclipse the feeling of doubt that's building. But it seems like you can't pay them to hire you now. My agents at the time told me it might be a while before I got a job acting on screen again. Well, that was fine because I never wanted to act in the, in the first place. I, and I definitely didn't want to be caught dead going after a fake Hollywood pipe dream. I'm more of a writer director anyway, so forget their stories. I can tell my own stories. As conflicted as I was before I lost the job, as adamant as I, I was about the need to speak truth to power, I found myself even more conflicted afterwards. Sometimes you need to get knocked down before you can really figure out what your, what your fight is and how you need to fight it. At some point, my mom reverted back to my experiences here, to the professors that challenged me and struggled against me. Finally, I thought of Ali in the middle of the yard. In his elder years, drawing from his victories and his losses. At that moment, I realized something new about this, the greatness of Ali and how he carried his crown. I realized that he was transferring something to me on that day. He was transferring the spirit of the fighter to me. Sometimes you need to feel the pain and sting of defeat to activate the real passion and purpose that God predestined inside of you. God says in Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Hear me well on this day. When you have reached the hilltop and you are deciding on, on next jobs, next steps, careers, further education, you would rather find purpose than a job or a career. Purpose crosses disciplines. Purpose is an essential element of you. It is the reason you are on the planet at this particular time in history. Your very existence is wrapped up in the things you are here to fulfill. Whatever you choose for a career path, remember the struggles along the way are only meant to shape you for your purpose. When I dare to challenge the system that would relegate us to Victims and stereotypes with no clear historical backgrounds, no hopes or talents. When I questioned that method of portrayal, a different path opened up for me. The path to my destiny. When God has something for you, it doesn't matter who stands against it. God will move someone that's holding you back away from a door and put someone there who will open it for you. If it's meant for you, I don't know what your future is, but if you are willing to take the harder way, the more complicated one, the one with more failures at first than successes, the one that has ultimately proven to have more meaning, more victory, more glory, 
then you will not regret it. Now, this is your time. <laughs> The light of new realization shines on you today. Howard's legacy is not wrapped up in the money that you will make, but the challenges that you choose to confront. As you commence to your past, press on with pride and press on with purpose. God bless you. I love you, Howard. Howard forever. I mean, the technology is great. You know, it's lots of fun, very helpful, makes a lot of things easy. Um, but like anything in the world, there is um, there is too much of a good thing, you know. Um, and I think one of the things we don't talk about is what is the balance of technology in our lives. And I would argue that for many of us, it's out of balance. Um, we know that the chemical dopamine is released whenever we get a bing, buzz, flash, or beep from our phone or email, right? So. Um, dopamine is the exact same chemical that's released in alcohol, nicotine, and gambling, right? In other words, it can be addictive if left unbalanced. A little alcohol is great. Too much alcohol, not so great. Gambling is fun. Too much gambling, really bad, right? Technology is wonderful. Too much technology can be very destructive and destroy our relationships like all addictions destroy our relationships. Right? Um, and so what the one thing we're not considering is what is the right balance. If you wake up in the morning and you check your phone before you say good morning to your spouse, that's a problem. Right? If you have phantom beeps, that's a problem. That comes from something. Right? Um, if you find yourself incapable of getting through a day without needing to check, that's a problem. Right? Now where it gets really dangerous is with kids. Millennials. Some of them aren't kids anymore. Right. Um, so almost all alcoholics on the planet discovered alcohol when they were children. When we're very, very young, the only thing we need is the approval of our parents. Right? When we go through adolescence, we now need approval from our peers. Frustrating for our parents, very important for us because it allows us to acculturate outside of our immediate families into the larger group. Right? Very stressful time. And we're supposed to learn in this time of anxiety to rely on our friends, to reach out to our friends for help. That's what we're supposed to learn. Some people, quite by accident, discover alcohol. And that they learn the numbing effects of dopamine actually help them get through the stress of adolescence. This connection, unfortunately, becomes hardwired. And so for the rest of their lives, when they face any kind of financial, career, or social stress, they don't turn to a person, they turn to the bottle, right? Now, we have age restrictions on alcohol, cigarettes, and gambling. Because we know that an immature mind is not yet strong enough or mature enough to deal with the powers of these addicting chemicals, these addictive chemicals, right? So we put an age limit. We have no such age limit or age restriction on social media or cell phones, right? So ostensibly what we've done is we've thrown open the liquor cabinet and we've said to our adolescents, hey, I know this whole adolescent thing is really stressful, so here's the vodka, take as much as you need. That's basically what we've done. And so what we have is an entire generation that's growing up addicted. And like all addicts, they haven't learned the skill set of when they suffer stress to turn to a person. What they do is they turn to the device. And what that only does is increase senses of isolation and loneliness, and can actually destroy relationships. We've all had the experience where you're with somebody walking down the street in a meeting, out for dinner, whatever, and they pull out their phone and you feel like an idiot, right? Or when you're talking to them and they're going, uh-huh, 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 and you're sort of like, what am I, what's the point of this? Now take an entire generation that has no memory of a time before the device. We at least can reference times before cell phones and internet and social media. We at least have a point of reference. They don't. So this is their normal, that that's how they feel. So you have an entire generation growing up with addiction and an increased sense of loneliness and isolation. 
We're already seeing the results. We're seeing increased rates of suicide amongst this generation. We're seeing increased rates of accidental deaths due to overdoses amongst this generation. We're seeing increased numbers of mass homicides, largely performed by this generation. School shootings, yeah. over 70% perpetrated by kids born after the year 1984. We, um, schools, universities, are now dealing with numbers they've never dealt with before of kids requesting leaves of absence due to depression. We're already seeing it, right? We're seeing the effects of loneliness and isolation. We're seeing it, and yet we're not reacting to it. We're not doing anything about it, right? And parents are a lot to blame for this. Because parents, there are some schools who want to restrict phones in the schools, and it's the parents who demand that they keep their phones in case of emergencies. Seriously? Seriously? When was the last time the cell phone was used for an emergency? So what time are you coming home? What time should we pick you up? And if there is an emergency, you call the office, and they know what classroom the kid's in, and in five minutes, they'll bring the kid to talk to you on the phone. Like, the old way worked just fine. Remember, we talked before about innovation. It has to solve a real human problem. What human problem exactly did we solve by compressing the five-minute time frame? We added to the problem. We didn't solve it. So that's one huge problem. So combine that with the facts. You have a, 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 an addicted generation that doesn't have the, the skill set to ask for help. Combine with the fact that they're so good at Facebook and Instagram, they're good at putting filters on everything. So they're good at showing you how smart and strong they are. These kids who commit suicide, you go look at their Instagrams, you would have no clue that they were depressed because they're happy and they're star athletes, right? You'd have no clue because they're really good. So when we say silly things like, my door is always open, you're assuming they have the courage to come in. Combined with the fact that they're subject largely, not all, but too many, to a failed parenting strategy. Because their parents told them they were special, they could have anything they wanted, they could be anything they want, they got medals for coming in last, which by the way we know doesn't work, it devalues the medal for the one who comes in first and the one who came in last, it makes them feel stupid because they know they didn't deserve it, right? The kids got into honors classes not because they deserved it, but because the parents complained. And some of them got good grades, not because they earned them, but because the teachers didn't want to deal with the parents. And then the kids graduate college, and they get a job, and in an instant, they find out they're not special, they don't get anything for coming in last, their parents can't get them a promotion, and you can't have whatever you want just because you want it. And in an instant, their entire self-image is shattered. And so you have an entire generation growing up with lower self-confidence than previous generations. So you have lower self-confidence than previous generations, combined with an inability to ask for help with things that are, you're struggling with, and you turn to social media or device, you keep checking, you keep checking, you count your likes, you count your likes, you count your followers, you count your followers, and if somebody unfriends you, oh my god, it's trauma, right? The way they break up with each other is they just ghost each other, just cut each other out and stop returning to texts, returning texts and returning phone calls, because they don't have the skill set to say, hey, it's not working out, it's not me, it's you, right? There's no closure on things, right? combined with the fact there's an institutionalized impatience. So they've grown up in a world of instant gratification. You want to buy something, you go on Amazon, it shows up the next day. You want to get in touch with someone, you don't leave a message on their machine and wait four hours for them to get the message, you just text them and they get back to you immediately. You want to watch a movie, you just log on and watch it. You don't have to check movie times, right? Everything happens instantly. You want to get a date, swipe right. You don't even have to muster up the courage to go up like, hey, you know? You don't have to. There you go, got a date, right? And so the problem is, they're accused of being entitled. I don't think they're entitled at all, not at all. I think they're impatient. I keep meeting these fantastic, smart, driven, ambitious, idealistic, fantastic kids who graduated school, they got a job, they wanna make an impact in the world, and I go up to them and say, how's it going? And they say, I think I'm gonna quit. I'm like, why? They're like, I'm not making an impact. I'm like, you've been here eight months. And it's as if, it's as if they see the summit of a mountain. It's as if they're standing at the foot of a mountain and they can see the summit, they can see the thing they want, I wanna make an impact. What they don't see is the mountain, this large, immovable object. You can go up fast, you can go up slow, I don't care, but there's still a mountain. What they don't understand is that life, that relationships and career fulfillment are a journey. There's no app for that. I got nothing. You gotta go through the slow, plodding, annoying, meandering process called career and life. But if they don't get it in eight months, they go look for it somewhere else. They don't get it, they go, go look for it somewhere else. It's impatience. And because they don't have the skill set to ask for help, 
and because they feel lonely, it compounds and compounds. So then yeah, we dump them in office environments that are built on theories from the 80s and 90s that prioritizes a number before a person, and no one really cares about their confidence and their personal growth. They're just numbers on a spreadsheet. And so they enter work cultures that don't help them. And the problem is they're entering the workforce at a deficit. I hear from kids, they tell me that they struggle to form deep meaningful relationships and the companies don't care. And so it's destructive to them as individuals, but ultimately it'll hurt the companies because more and more millennials are entering the workforce. I believe, to your point about solution, that now the responsibility on companies is even greater than it's ever been before to take care of its people. Because if the environments in which we're asking our youngest workers to work in isn't built to help them, I can't even imagine what the suicide and, and homicide and just the rates of depression, you know, an accidental death due to overdose are gonna look like in the future. It's gonna reach epidemic proportions. It's already, the, the, the statistics are already alarming and yet nobody's sounding any alarm bells. Parents have to intervene. We have to stop giving our kids free access to social media and, and phones at young ages. They are not ready for it. Their minds cannot cope with the dopamine. Balance is fine. You can give a kid a phone, but they can't use it in their bedroom. They can't have it at the dinner table. They can't take it to school. They can only have it up to a certain hour and you take it away. They're children. You can take the phone away. We've got to intervene as parents. But as companies, we now have to deal with the influx of kids that are coming into our companies with addiction. Watch, I see it all the time. Walk through any office. You'll see the older employees have their phones on the sides of their computers as they're working. You'll see the youngest employees have their phones face up in front of their keyboards between their arms as they're working. And this is how they work. And the, the, the science is alarming. They did uh, experiments on mice where they, they did the multitasking. They put flashing lights to mimic going from the computer to the cell phone, the computer to the cell phone, to the TV. The mice that were exposed to the changing lights, it took them three times longer to solve a maze than the mice that weren't. And the damage was permanent. It didn't improve when they stopped the lights. Never. And leadership now is even more important. Yeah. And the leaders now are even more irresponsible. You are responsible for the lives of human beings, and some of these human beings are your children. So okay, you bad CEO who thinks all the stuff that I talk about is craziness. And you don't have time to make these changes. This is what I hear. We don't have time. It's a war out there. I've actually heard executives tell me that. It's a war out there. I don't have time for this leadership stuff. I know guys who go to war, and I'll tell you, it's not a war, what you're going through. You know, you tinker with money. It's not a war. You do have time for this. And if it's really that way, then what were you doing when it wasn't a war? It's even more, it's what an indictment that in peaceful times, when times were good, that you weren't focusing on this stuff, right? But my point is, is a lot of these executives have children of this age working at other companies. And my question is, would you like those other companies, would you like those other executives to care about the growth of your child, the confidence of your child, the career success of your child? Would you like those other companies to help your kids learn the skills of social interaction, the ability to ask for and receive help? Would you like their jobs to give that to them? Set the example. Do it for other people's children. Every single employee, 100% is someone, someone, someone's daughter. 100%. And if you want someone to take responsibility for the life of your children in their company, then why don't we start taking responsibility for the lives of the children in our companies? When you realize that your name, your form, and everything you see is provisional, two things happen. To some people, they have immediate, what we could only metaphorically call the dark night of the soul. They go into a deep depression because everything they thought was real is no longer real, including their own name, form, body, and mind. Some people get so scared that they have a bad trip. Some people cross that threshold and discover nirvana or <laughs> enlightenment. And they say, wow, I thought I was, I was squeezed into the volume of a body in the span of a lifetime, but I'm a timeless being that can morph myself into any experience, including the human experience, which is amazing. But the human experience is also that which causes existential depression. 
So the causes of human suffering, since you brought it up, are brought up in Eastern wisdom traditions as, number one, you suffer because you don't know who you are. You confuse yourself with your body-mind experience. Number two, you grasp and cling at experiences which are evanescent and transitory and dreamlike. You say, what happened to your childhood? It's over. What happened to yesterday? It's over. What happened to five minutes ago? It's over. What happens to these words? By the time you hear them, they don't exist. So, you know, Wittgenstein, the German philosopher said, we are asleep. Our life is a dream, but once in a while we wake up enough to know that we are dreaming. So what do you wake up to? When you cross this threshold, you wake up to your true self, which uh, is not body or mind, but the awareness in which that experience is happening. So grasping and clinging at a dream is the second cause of human suffering. The third is uh, being afraid of anything that's unpleasant, pain abandonment, being treated by someone uh, not respectfully. So that's, you know, there's aversion to certain experiences. Third cause of suffering. Fourth is identifying, which is related to it, with your ego identity. And fifth is the fear of death. Now they're all connected. They're all the same fear. And they are not knowing who you are. This is the biggest question everybody should be asking. Who am I? What am I? Am I the changing experience of this body, which is a perceptual activity? Am I the experience of the changing mind or the changing personality? Because you don't have the same personality when you were a kid or maybe even 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. What is it at the basis of this? When you start that reflective self-inquiry, ask yourself, who am I? What do I want? What is my purpose? What am I grateful for? go into the stillness of meditation, you have what wisdom traditions have called revelation, revealed truth. Now, you know, that sounds very grand. I would say just call it insight. You know, meditation, mindfulness, uh, awareness of body, awareness of mind, awareness of mental space, awareness of the web of relationship, awareness with that which we call the universe. It leads you ultimately to the awareness of awareness. And when you discover that, that's nirvana. Now, everyday experience is modified consciousness. So right now what we're experiencing is what we call the waking state of consciousness. So awareness is modifying itself every time you open your eyes into this experience, right? And you call it the physical world. Now, if you close your eyes, you have another state of consciousness where you don't actually experience the physical world. You experience sensations, images, thoughts, emotions, stories. It's like a dream. As soon as you close your eyes, you're experiencing, you might call it daydreaming, but there's no difference between a daydream and what you dream at night. The physical world has disappeared. There's only a mental world. Then you go deeper at night even the mental world disappears in what we call deep, deep sleep. Now that is the highest intelligence, by the way, because in deep sleep, there's unconscious processing going on, there's creativity going on, there are correlations being made, there are toxins being removed, there's a whole resetting of your uh, memories and consolidation of that. So in deep sleep, even though there's no experience of a physical or a mental world, it's a very intelligent, highly, highly correlated state in which unconscious processing is occurring. Memories are being consolidated. Imagination is being refined, etc. even though you have no conscious experience. So think of these three states metaphorically, like you would think of water becoming ice as the physical world, water as water, fluid, dreamy, water as vapor, even more dreamy and fluctuating and ambiguous and contradictory and difficult to grasp. But if you want a little bit beyond that, I'm speaking metaphorically, you'd end up with what is called the quantum vacuum, which is the fundamental ground of existence according to science. But you can do that 
Subjectively, you can move from the physical world to the dream world, to the sleep world, and beyond to what is called fundamental consciousness, which is the source of all knowing, all experience. In wisdom traditions, it's called undifferentiated consciousness. So what is reality? What we call reality, what today's science calls reality, comes under the heading of naive realism. Einstein was a naive realist. And I'm not saying this in a derogatory fashion. It's, it, it's, it's a word in the science of philosophy. Naive realism means that the physical world exists exactly as perceived by the five human senses. Now, obviously, that's not true. Other species experience the world through different modes of sensory perception. The second aspect of naive realism is that the physical world, as perceived by the five human senses, would exist even if no one was observing it. Well, how do you prove that? And firstly, it's naive because we know that the world is more than what is perceived by the five human senses. So this leads us to a solution, actually, of the hard problem of consciousness, which is get rid of the idea that the world is physical. What we call of the world as physical, even your physical body, is a perceptual activity. And that perceptual activity for you and me is a human perceptual activity through human consciousness, not through bat consciousness, not through mosquito consciousness, not through plant consciousness. But non-dualism says, go beyond that. There is only one consciousness that is differentiating, you know, undifferentiated consciousness, differentiating into these different species of consciousness that form a matrix of conscious beings that are collectively projecting this universe. I don't think consciousness being formless and infinite is subject to either birth or death. This is a vacation we are having on planet Earth right now, and so might as well enjoy it. But death is not the end of consciousness, it's the end of a certain storyline in consciousness a certain interpretation of perceptions, images, feelings, and thoughts. It's not that I don't think about death. I ask myself, what is beyond my provisional identity? And I dwell in that, and that has a very interesting outcome, which is the outcome in every spiritual tradition. There are only three things that happen, by the way, in a religious or traditional experience. One is transcendence. You know that you are not an entity in space and time, that your true self is formless, infinite, unbounded, borderless, unfettered, free consciousness, number one. Number two, you have the emergence of what usually are referred to as platonic truths, goodness, beauty, harmony, love, compassion, joy, equanimity. And number three, loss of the fear of death. There's nothing more important than having those three experiences. And they've been part of every wisdom tradition for thousands of years. Love is not a sentiment. Love is not an emotion. Love is the ultimate truth at the heart of creation, which is unity consciousness. One consciousness differentiating into infinite modes of experience, infinite knowers, infinite modes of knowing, infinite phenomena known, all generated within the one self. Just like when you were just a fertilized ovum, you were one step cell, stem cell, pluripotential cell. It became eyes, it became nose, it became fingernails, it became heart, it became brain. So that one cell differentiated into all these different cells, each with its own modality of experience. Like that, the one mind, the one consciousness, differentiates itself into what we call the universe with every species of consciousness knowing the universe in its own unique way.